Okay, great. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the Cherry Hill Board of Education meeting on June the 8th, 2021. Public notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given by the board secretary on June 2nd, 2021 in the following manner. Posted notice on the school bulletin board of the administration building transmitted to the Courier Post, Philadelphia Inquirer, and the clerk of Cherry Hill Township. Turn it over. Oh, oh, sorry, we'll rise for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll we'll turn it over to Mrs. Sugars for a roll call. Royal. Here. Mrs. Stratton. Here. Ms. Friedel. Here. Mrs. Matlack. Here. Mr. Avadia. Here. Mrs. Schultz. Here. Mrs. Stern. Mrs. Tong. Here. There we go. Mary. Here. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. I'll begin the meeting with an announcement, a bit of good news, as our governor has ended the public health emergency beginning in August, the board will return to uh, full board meetings in person, starting with our August meetings. If you've been following, we returned um, some in person for our committee meetings uh, for June. So beginning in August, we will be returning in person. So with that, I will then turn it over to Dr. Malash, as I believe we have something under board recognition this evening. We do, thank you, Mrs. Neary. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce to the board and to the community, our student board rep from Cherry Hill High School East and Cherry Hill High School West. Uh, so I just moved the students over from the attendee side to the panelist side. Uh, so students, if you would turn your cameras on um, and I'm going to read their names uh, so that you can start to meet them and get to know who they are. Uh, first representative from Cherry Hill High School East, uh, rising senior Ariana Santiago Ramos. Ariana, she's waiting. Nice to meet you. Uh, the student uh, board alternate representative from Cherry Hill High School East, rising senior Ziv and Silly. Ziv, welcome. From Cherry Hill High School West, uh, the student board representative, Kevin Salvatorelli. Kevin? And from Cherry Hill High School West, the student alternate representative is Sam Messias. Sam? So because all four of you are here this evening, I'm actually gonna move the alternates back over to the public side and our student board reps, Ariana and Kevin will remain on the board uh, side of the meeting. And then for the four of you, I, Mrs. Wilson and I, uh, Mrs. Wilson is the student or the public information officer, will be in touch over the course of the next week to talk about your first board reports that you will give at the June 22nd Board of Education meeting. I'm thrilled that you are willing to take on this responsibility. It's a lot of responsibility. You will become the faces and the voices on behalf of the student body with the Board of Education. So thank you for your enthusiasm and your willingness to be here this evening. And we'll look forward to follow up conversation. So Ariana and Kevin, we're gonna have both of you remain in the meeting. And then Ziv and Sam, we're gonna move you back over to the attendee side, okay? All right, congratulations. Okay, great, thank you, Dr. Malash. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. Okay, so that now brings us to presentations, and I believe we have a presentation this evening, Dr. Malash, for the Alternative High School update. We do. Let me just move these back over. Five, 
Ms. Giordano. Um, Mrs. Weddington. Do you know if we are set with Mrs. Giordano? I will follow up, Dr. Malash. I am not seeing her on the other side. Although with the storm, she may be jammed up with thunder and lightning or power and uh, internet connection. So, uh, Ms. Neary, if we're able to get in touch with Ms. Giordano, then if we could just slide her in at a later time during the meeting, that would be ideal. If not, we'll regroup for the 22nd and have Ms. Giordano join us on the 22nd. Okay, no problem. Well, then that'll bring us to, or, and if she joins, perhaps we can do her after the we return to learn That's a good suggestion. Okay, perfect. Then I will turn it back to you and Dr. Mayhem for the we return to learn. All right, let me just get this side ready to go. Hi, Dr. Mayhem. Good evening, Dr. Malash. Good evening, members of the board. In just a second, Dr. Mann, so I can get us situated on the screens in the room. Dr. Mann, you can see you're good? Yes, I can see the slides. All right. Uh, so this evening, uh, we are really excited to do the, the update and this presentation tonight uh, regarding the return to learn and returning to school full time on September 9th, 2021. So Dr. Mahan and I uh, and Mrs. Weddington and Mrs. Wilson and Mrs. Sugars and Ms. Adrian and Mr. Clark, uh, Mr. Burrell, some of our school principals, we've been spending time over the course of the last few months going through all of this information to put it together uh, so we can give an update on where we are right now. So Dr. Mahan and I We'll actually both be going through talking about um, different slides this evening. So first, again, we always begin with our mission statement. This is the foundation for who we are and for what we believe as a school district. Again, there are parts of this mission statement that have become ever more uh, actual and true during the course of the last year and a half. Um, it's, it's one that was adopted just a handful of years ago. Uh, after some work that was done within the district, we had students and staff members and alumni, um, community members that participated in the discussion to develop our mission statement. So we always think it's important to begin our discussions, especially when we're talking about the academic year and the education with our mission statement. The next piece, uh, these are our three strategic goals. These are the three strategic goals the Board of Education adopted in February of 2020 to carry the district through 2025. So as we look at these three goals, again, there was a level of understanding uh, from all of the work that went on within the community. We had Judy Wilson came and spent time with us over the course of about seven months to do some visioning work, to do some framing work. There were surveys, there were small group discussions, there were uh, focus groups within schools to boil all of that down to these three key areas of student wellness, purpose and passion, and connecting beyond our classrooms. These are the questions, these are the guides that we use in making determinations about academics, about experiences within the classroom and outside of the classroom for our students, about how we spend money and about what it is that we choose to do and where we are choosing to move as a public school district. So again, important for us foundationally for where we are. Looking specifically here, this is what, what we know as of today, June 8th, 2021. Our focus, and this slide honestly is identical to the slide from presentation we did last July. We know that the health and safety of our students and staff is our first priority. It has been our first priority well before the pandemic, it's been our first priority during the pandemic, and it will remain as our first priority after the pandemic. 
We know that our students and staff are the most important of who we are as a community. As an educational community in Cherry Hill, the best of what we have are the children, the nearly 11,000 students with whom we are entrusted on a daily basis. The 1,700 staff members that make up our daily educational community, it's the best of who we are. And again, the most important part of who we are. We also know, and again, this slide is identical to the presentation from last summer, Public education will never look the same as it did before March 16th of 2020. We talk about wanting to get back to normal. There's no going back to what it was. Place and improve as we move forward, but there's no returning back to before March 16th of 2020. We also know and are reminded of this, Pretty regularly, even now in, the, in early June of 2021, the information that's, re that's released by and the recommendations from state and federal government and officials, that the information is fluid, it's ever evolving and ever changing, and often it's changing on consecutive days. Often things are said in a press conference or in a press release, but there's no clarification or definition. So everybody's coming up with an operational definition of what they think things mean. As a school district, we have been conservative in our steps, always maintaining a focus on health and safety and working with and working together with our peers, our colleagues, getting information from the Department of Health, from the Department of, of Education about how we are proceeding and moving forward. We also know the prescribed health and safety guidelines outlined by New Jersey and Camden County Departments of Health are designed to mitigate risk. That's the design. That's why they are there, especially in the midst of dealing with the pandemic. So we are on the road back. So as Dr. Malash said, we will not return to what we would call normal before March 16th, but we are definitely on the road back to reinventing and reimagining our schools the way they have always been. Throughout this entire process, we have continued to be excited, enthusiastic, and positive about the road back. And you know, it is with great enthusiasm this evening that we are able to address many of the areas that members of the Board of Education, parents, teachers, and community members have asked about. So we are continuing on the journey, but we are definitely moving in the right direction. So Areas that we are going to highlight this evening, and I don't want to read all of the items on the slide, but again, these are areas that have been discussed by our Board of Education, by parents, by community members, by teachers. Um, we have been emailed about these topics, and we want to make sure that we are addressing all areas, including masks, health and PE and music, field trips, special education and compensatory education, and school age child care. So we will go through each of these areas and provide as much detail as possible as we are, again, already planning for the return to school and our road back for September of 2021. So the first piece that, that we're gonna look at is the wearing of masks. So masks have continued to be a hot topic of discussion becoming even more of a hot topic of discussion during the course um, of the springtime as it gets warmer and more humid outside. A um, lot of discussion about masks. Well, we know that as of today, we still need to wear masks in school during the course of the academic day. That is still the expectation, the guidelines are coming out from the state, even with the change of executive orders from the governor, he has still identified that in, in certain settings, public schools being one of them, uh, that masks need to continue to be worn. In his press conference yesterday, he made a statement and released a little graphic uh, about dealing with masks and not wearing masks in extreme heat. Um, you know, in the local districts to make determinations that best suited or met the needs of their communities. Now, that information is not necessarily different than what it has been all along from his executive order. We put out clarifying information today. Two different emails came out. Um, the second one. Uh, we just put it again what the guidelines have been back in the middle of May, May 17th. We put out about masks and dealing with extreme heat. 
We put a lot of information in the email about extreme heat back in May, and we did again today. Because again, we're making trying to provide as much detail and as transparency as possible for people. So when we talk about extreme heat, extreme heat is, de is defined by the National Weather Service as 80 degrees or above, or the heat index, which combines the, the temperature and the humidity that's 80 or above. That's what's considered extreme heat. The CDC considers extreme heat. They don't give it a number because it's different depending upon where in the country you are and what the normal temperatures are. So as a school district, as we worked with uh, the Department of Health, as we talked as a district, we have provided that information from the CDC and from the National Weather Service that extreme heat is above 79 degrees in temperature or in heat index. We've been following that with outside activities. Students can re remove masks. They're involved in intense or aerobic uh, activities. Now, the clarification that came out was about in school. Uh, and if the temperatures are above 79 degrees in a classroom or in a space in school, we will allow children to remove their masks. They don't have to. I heard from a number of parents last night and today um, asking and requesting and demanding that masks be done away with and, and optional. I heard from almost the same number of parents who contacted me, making sure that masks would continue to be worn uh, by students in school. There are definitely two perspectives and two sides of understanding about what to do with masks. That's why we take the information that we receive. We got an email, an update from the Department of Education today at a little after 1130. Um, with less than an hour, we put that information, turned it around, put it out to staff, put it out to the community. Um, so that people would know what steps we are taking uh, and where we are. The latest information we've received from the governor's office and from the Department of Ed and from the Department of Health is that masks will still need to be worn in September. Now saying that it's June 8th, as I said, uh, on September the 9th, which is our first day of school, it's a long ways away, it's three months away from today. There's gonna be a lot of discussion and a lot of changes, I am sure, and information that comes out from the state between now and September 9th. As that information is released, we will continue to share that uh, with the community. Some other things, uh, we're gonna continue to encourage, one of the things that, that we've learned um, and that we've talked a lot about, again, with health and safety being a focus, is we're gonna continue to ask parents to have their children screen at home every day to see how they feel. Right? A good discussion before the kids leave the house to come to school. We're going to tell our staff members to do the same thing, not necessarily just because of COVID, but just in general. Right? For years, uh, we want to make sure that if children do not feel well, they're sick, then they should stay home to get healthy. The same thing with staff members. If they do not feel well, they should stay home to get healthy. So we're going to encourage people to continue to screen at home. We will still, when we reopen in September, have hand sanitizer and wipes available in all of our classrooms. Hand sanitizer will be available in the large spaces at our entrances. Um, there will still be trifold plastic dividers will be available. Some students and families have asked if they continue to use them. And yes, of course they can continue to use them if they feel more comfortable in using them. They will not be on all the desks and they will not be required, but they will still be available. Some of our principals and our staff members and our students recognize some advantages to some of the traffic flow changes that they use putting into school, not just in the hallway, but in terms of arrival and dismissal and what that looked like for our students and families. Much of that will continue as well. We will continue to limit visitors in our building. Now, in saying that we will limit visitors, we will still have a combination um, of people in person and people who will, um, you know, in, in person for meetings and activities. Um, we will talk about this summer, what does it look like for PTA groups, for Art Goes to School, bookmates, assemblies, and for meetings. There are some parents that have told us IEP meetings and 504 meetings have been much more effective for them to be able to attend and with their schedules when they are done virtually. We are not necessarily going to completely do away with virtual meetings because they've worked for many families. It's allowed us to be more efficient in terms of what's going on, and it's allowed more parents to participate in activities such as that than we have ever had the opportunity for before. Additional information will come out specifically from the schools in August uh, later this summer. In terms of use of facilities, uh, we'll be looking to allow outside groups to continue to, uh, to return to using our indoor facilities uh, beginning 
beginning on September 1st. There's information on how to request use facilities is on our website. When this presentation gets posted online, you'll be able to click the link uh, that's in here. We've continued to allow uh, outside groups, um, sports clubs, soccer clubs, lacrosse, field hockey, uh, those groups have continued to use our outdoor facilities uh, during the, the past year. So Dr. Malash just reviewed the first two items on our agenda for this evening, mask and structuring process. The next area that I will review is school start times. As we have said throughout this entire process, we are committed to returning students to five full days of in-person instruction for the 2021-2022 academic year. On the next few slides, you will see the times for each of the levels. So here we start with the Bar Barclay Early Childhood Center. The times listed are for the AM class, the PM class, and then students who attend full day, the Barclay Early Childhood Center. Next, we have for all of our elementary schools, grades K to five. Again, students returning for five full days. The academic day is from nine until 3.30. Students who are in the middle schools will attend school, again, five full days, in person, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And students at the high school, I think the adjustment will be um, the most um, intense for students at the high school level. We will be returning to a 7.30 a.m. start time and a 2.30 dismissal time for the upcoming school year. That will also be the time for the alternative high school. As we are on the road back and we are continuing to transition back to five full days in person, it is strongly encouraged that students start to remember the routine that they had pre-pandemic because our start times, arrival and dismissal times will not be changing. The next area on our agenda of topics, so I just review start times, is now meals and recess. So again, a lot of discussion about meals. We are excited to have our students have the opportunity to have breakfast and lunch back in our schools. There will be assigned meal times. Um, and at each level, they have designated lunch periods that exist, breakfast times, will continue to be prior to the beginning of the academic day. The actual service of the meals is continuing to be discussed. So the Department of Agriculture has already indicated that students, all students will be eligible for meals while they are in school. So we're working with our, our partners at Aramark with our building principals about what that will look like for children to secure meals. Because again, in order to have opportunity for choice and, and what's being prepared, there needs to be an idea about how many meals need to be prepared each day at each of the schools. But there will be full breakfast, there will be lunch that will be available uh, every single day that we are in school. We'll look at expanding the lunch location options for our students, not just in the cafeteria and the APR, uh, we're looking at outdoors. In fact, uh, this is Sugar's has been working very closely with the facilities folks and the elementary principals uh, to order exterior canopies, covered areas uh, that students can use uh, on the, uh, at each one of our elementary schools. We're having discussions about what that might look like at the secondary schools, but we're going through a process right now to get those ordered uh, at the elementary level. So there'll be outdoor options that'll be available. There may be classroom options that will be available, and there will certainly be at the secondary levels designated locations as we've used at the high schools uh, back since 2012 uh, when we changed the, the lunch procedures there. So we are looking forward to, again, that continuing to go on in school. As I said, meals will be provided free to all students. We will continue to encourage families to fill out the free and reduced lunch paperwork. We will still have a very big push going into the next academic year. The free and reduced lunch forms, they affect and impact the amount of Title I funds that we receive as a school district. They also impact families in terms of their eligibility for the EBT cards um, that they're able to receive to secure food for their children. Um, so again, we'll be designated breakfast and lunch times in the schools. As I said, we're gonna work with Aramark 
Um, building specific, because again, there will be nuances uh, at each one of the buildings based on the number of students and what the physical facilities of the schools look like that will come out from the building principals in August about what lunch and breakfast will look like specifically. So I'm excited because later tonight, there's gonna to be an update talking about cafeteria and recess educational assistant positions. These are new positions that we're looking to create to have additional uh, people come work for us to help supervise and support lunch and recess at the elementary level. So if you or somebody you know is looking for a position in the middle of the day to work with our wonderful children at our schools, we could be looking for you. So the job postings will come out soon. We'll be pushing it out in lots of areas so people will be able to see it, but it'll be updated with the board uh, later on this evening during our regular meeting. Uh, we also expect that during recess, based on the Department of Ed and the Camden County Department of Health guidelines, children will be allowed to use playground equipment at the early childhood center and at the elementary school. And now moving on to health, physical education and music. So we love to utilize our outdoor spaces for health and physical education class. Teachers will continue to maximize outdoor space areas. However, we would like to have um, students utilizing our gymnasiums, the APRs, our weight rooms, um, and appropriate uh, supplies and materials during PE and health class. There will be appropriate cleaning of materials and supplies as needed. Students are reminded to dress appropriately as there is no inappropriate weather, just inappropriate dress. We wanna be sure that our students are prepared to appropriately and actively participate in their health and physical education classes. For our music programs, students, parents, community members, teachers are looking forward to the return of in-person music and vocal classes and our theatrical productions. We have a robust program. Our students thrive in the arts and in theater, and they have definitely been impacted by the pandemic. So we are eager to move forward in this area. And we anticipate that all of these programs will resume in a traditional format beginning in September of 2021. Dr. Mann, I was just going to say, I've, I've spoken with a lot of music teachers and heard from a lot of music teachers at all three levels. They are absolutely thrilled they're going to be in full days of school and students being back on our campuses full time in September. If this is the year that you're, if you have a child that has not necessarily played an instrument in the past or has not considered it, this is absolutely the year to take it up. Our instrumental music teachers at all three levels are definitely looking for more students to both play instruments and to sing, get involved. Everybody has their own natural instrument in their voice. We have incredibly talented teachers who would love to work with our students of any level of experience at any level of school to be able to participate in these classes. Thank you, Dr. Malash. And because we will be having transportation next year, your child will be able to carry their instrument on the bus. So, uh, transportation next year. We again are anticipating that we will be providing all of our regular bus routes. The drivers and students will be masked at the bus stop and on the bus. A practice that we have had for many years, but again, we will continue during the pandemic is that students will need to be in assigned seats and remain seated for the duration of the trip. That is not new for our schools. Students who are living in the same household, who attend the same school, will be seated together on the bus. High touch areas will be continue to be sanitized in between routes. And as always, the buses will be cleaned each night. Information from schools will be shared probably in mid-August as it is shared every year for families regarding the arrival and dismissal procedures, not only for bus students, but also for walkers and for parent drop-offs. So that information again will come out from the building level. As this year, some of our drop-off and arrival procedures did change. Um, some of the takeaways that we have learned during the pandemic will stay in place. Others will return back to 
what we experienced prior to the pandemic. And if your child is not interested in carrying their instrument on the bus and they are interested in extracurricular activities and athletics, they will also be able to ride the bus and take their athletic gear and or yearbook or other supplies with them onto the bus. So for our extracurricular activities for the upcoming year, we anticipate that, that, that they will be starting in the summer and will continue during the academic year. Registration for the fall begins on June 15th for the high school and middle school activities. As always, information will be sent to parents via Blackboard and information about start dates and times and requirements for all extracurricular activities will be sent directly from the school and for the advisor responsible for the extracurricular activity. If there are questions, as we always say, your first contact is your building principal and or the advisor for the activity. Mr. Burrell was able to share with us his enthusiasm around the return of athletics in a more normal fashion that will begin again in the summer. Registration for athletics also will begin on June 15th will go out to all parents via Blackboard, which is consistent with what has happened pre-pandemic. As of June 8th, there are no special COVID protocols required by NJSIAA. So we anticipate that all sports programs will be running as normal pre-pandemic beginning this summer. Football is slated to begin on August 9th. All other high school sports are slated to begin August 16th and middle school sports are slated to begin September 14th. If you have questions regarding athletics, you can reach out to Mr. Burrell, who is the director of athletics or the building-based athletic director at the schools. Our next area is field trips. Dr. Malash, do you want me to continue? Yep, I'm just waiting. Oh, there we go. Okay. We're having a little, little bit of an internet issue with the uh, flat panel. Okay. Um, but you can see that we're on the slide about field trips, right? Yes, we can see it. All right. So field trips, one of the, the things that we have not had this year uh, across the board are field trips. Uh, we have wonderful field trip experiences. Again, you know, one of our board goals deals with uh, extending the class, you know, extending uh, our children's learning experience beyond the classroom walls. Um, and we did not use field trips this year because of the experiences, uh, because of the reality of the pandemic. So we are looking to reintroduce field trips next year back into our regular program. Uh, field trips will be evaluated on an individual basis. They'll also be evaluated at the levels. There are anchor field trips that we've used historically at the elementary, middle, and high school level. We'll continue to look at each one of those. Final determinations about field trips being approved will be made based on the public health status and any mitigation requirements. We'll be reviewing during the course of the summer with our administrative team going over the protocols about field trips being approved. We have a, a pretty robust process for field trips to be approved. We have become probably, uh, people have become comfortable with the process in the past. So we're gonna remind people about what has to happen before the field trips can be advertised and before they can be communicated uh, out. So we review all of that. One of the big ones that we've heard about from a lot of folks during the course of the last year and a half has been about the Mount Misery experience. Um, no final determination has been made yet about Mount Misery. Uh, the folks that own Mount Misery, they've changed their protocols and the requirements. Uh, that they're requiring guests to follow in terms of the number of people that can be there at once and the number of people that they can feed in their dining hall. Um, so that uh, is all factoring into the discussions that we are having about what it is that we can do. And in looking at that, traditionally, Mount Misery is a sixth grade experience. Currently, uh, or starting in September of 2021, we'll have sixth graders, all of our seventh graders, and many of our eighth graders at Carusi 
who did not attend and will need to have that or want to have that Mount Misery experience. So no determination has been made yet. There will be more discussion about that. Um, we'll have some the, the principals at the middle schools and parents and staff members will be involved talking about what that looks like. Uh, so we hope to have more for you as it's available. Special education, English language learners, and compensatory education. So special ed and uh, special education and ELL, English language learner students, uh, all students who are eligible for special ed and related services will fully participate in those experiences uh, and in those services. Our ELL students uh, also will receive their full complement of experiences and services within the school setting. With special education, it includes students in special classes, behavioral and emotional support, learning and language disabled, the autistic support, multiply disabled, and our alternative high school program. There are specific discussions going on for each one of those groups. And again, what it looks like back into a full-time, full-day, meals included experience for these children. For our ELL students, all students in grade K to 12 will attend in person in the ELL program. And again, in terms of language immersion and for children to continue to learn from our ELL teachers, again, one of our largest and most dynamic departments within the school district, we know it's gonna be incredibly valuable for all of these children to be in school on a full day and in a full day setting. In terms of compensatory education for students with disabilities, this features specifically with students who have an IEP and have had an IEP during the course of this academic year. Compensatory education is, is being discussed with families right now, uh, addresses services missed during the pandemic. The goal of the compensatory education, to remedy knowledge and skills deficits, ensure the student has the opportunity to achieve goals and objectives. The need for compensatory education is a discussion that takes place at an IEP team meeting. The IEP team is the only one that can make that determination. Building principals cannot decide on compensatory education. I cannot decide on compensatory education. Mrs. Wethington, Ms. Mallory, those are discussions that have to take place with the IEP teams. Um, also, just as a, a compensatory education, because people have asked, it's not necessarily determined that if a child missed five hours of services, that they are to get five hours of services at a later date. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's discussing, it's discussed about what is needed in order to support that child. Again, folks that are involved in those discussions and process uh, will have a better understanding of what that means. If you need more detail or information or have questions about it, please don't hesitate to look out or to reach out to the child study team case manager, to one of our people services supervisors, or to Ms. Mallory, our director of special education. And this gives more information about compensatory ed, focuses on the IEP team. And again, the IEP team is that group that comes together that involves the parents and could involve the student depending upon age, involves different staff members who are involved in the child's experiences within the school district. And they have that discussion uh, about what's needed uh, and what can be done. If there are questions, again, reach out directly, contact child study team case manager, uh, always the best place to start with those questions and with those inquiries. And then school age childcare, our SAC program. So our school age childcare runs before school and after school at our elementary schools. SAC is ready to go. They've been running throughout the course of this year when we have had in-person learning. They're excited to be back into a regular schedule five days a week for before school and after school care. Um, SAC is operational. And again, letters went out earlier. Uh, they've already received lots of follow-up from folks. Their initial registration closed on June the 1st. Uh, confirmation emails will be going out later this month. Um, there are students and families that are on the wait list. If you have an inquiry about a spot, you can still send, still contact uh, the SAC office with your questions. And with your inquiries, they'll tell you what next steps to take. Uh, spots are always filled as people um, reach out to the SAC office and make their deposits. And then we will continue to run our holiday SAC program. Uh, which occurs most days that schools are closed. And again, information specifically about those programs will come out uh, prior to, or about those days will come out prior to the uh, days occurring, but it's on most days that schools are closed, there would normally be a day of school. For holidays, not for inclement weather, not Saturdays and Sundays. 
And then finally, we will do formal update presentations to the Board of Education and the community on July the 13th, July the 27th. Those are our two board meetings in July, on August the 10th, and on August the 24th. Those are our two board meetings in August. I fully expect that there will be updates and some transition uh, in terms of information that's included tonight will be more fleshed out in detail on July 13th and the 27th. And there may be some changes in terms of masks or playgrounds or other things. We continue to get additional information from the Department of Ed and from the Department of Health. As that information comes out to that, we will share that with the community as it is available, and then we will put it into the formal presentation. Our website, there's an incredible information that our tech department, Mr. Plavinsky and his team, Mrs. Wilson through public information, Mrs. Weathington and Dr. Mahan that they have put together during the course of this year that's on our website, we'll begin to transition that information and to prepare to have updates that focus specifically on 2021 2022. So if there's a, a specific place for everybody to look, we will maintain in an archive that's easily accessible online all of the information that's been posted during the course of this academic year. Expect that transition to take place once this academic year has ended next Friday. So by the end of June, we'll make that transition in terms of what the website contains uh, and what it looks like. So we are excited to do these presentations. We will actually feature some special guests to do presentations. We'll have some of our building principals and some other folks uh, who will join us in July and August with updates to the board and to the community uh, about this. And we end with our last slide, as always. We welcome questions to help, to help support clarity and provide transparency. We need your feedback to help us to reflect and make things better for the students that we serve. And the discussion, again, helps us to gain clarity on where we are, where we are going, and how we will get there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mahan. And Thanks. Mrs. Neary, let me stop the sharing. Okay. And there you go. I will turn it back to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Mahan and Dr. Malash. Uh, Dr. Malash, did we have Ms. Giordano now to give the other presentation? We do. Okay, this is, let me get her in on the right side. Oh, I'm sorry. The board members, I apologize. I can't see out of one eye right now. Um, if any of the board members had questions on the presentation, I apologize. Uh, Mr. Avadi has his hand up, Ms. Neary. Okay, thank you. Mr. Obadia? Yeah, I just wanted to, first of all, thank uh, Dr. Malash and Dr. Mahan for, you know, for not just the presentation, but the work that's gone into it. Um, just as a point of clarity, so anyone anywhere in our system that is a student um, will be eligible for free lunches for the entirety of the school year. Yes. And for breakfast. And for breakfast. And if I'm a parent, just thinking about it's probably wise for the first week or two to pack some lunch anyway, because we're gonna to try to get a, a sense for how much that's subscribed. Day one, we probably will not have a breakfast and lunch for every student, that's probably not. So that's a good question, Mr. Buddy. And that's one of the things that we're working on right now. Mrs. Sugars uh, and the principals are working with Mr. Bridges um, from, um, he's our manager from Aramark uh, about how do we order, how do we identify? Because what we don't wanna do is prepare a lot of food and then throw it out. Right. Um, and that's, you know, we don't want to be in that situation uh, at all. You know, so some of the discussions we've had, you know, normally um, there are, are multiple choices for meals, you know, so what does it look like in terms of preparation? So more information will come out about that during the course of the summer. Yes, as far as we've got from the Department of Agriculture is that they're going to carry it through um, the academic year. There any sense that we'll do some surveying or will we just sort of go back based on action? first couple of weeks. I believe that we'll probably be in contact with parents and ask them to follow up with us, you know, so that if, if we've got, you know, take Kingston, it's a couple of blocks from here. If Dr. Marvel's got 400 kids that are there, that in some way they'll be in contact with the parents to say, is your child gonna eat breakfast on the first day of school? So that they're not preparing 400 breakfasts, right. you know, so if they have a, a round number, you know, and have stuff that they can prepare, if extra show up, but at least have that ready to go, some sort of, of program to do that. What that looks like specifically, I'm not sure yet. Okay. And I just want to call out that 
even if a family is being served in this way, there are still advantages to that family in being in the free and reduced lunch program. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to encourage both the eating every meal they can. Yes. And also this, this extra piece. But so we are. We're going to, and we'll probably start earlier again this summer about making the, the forms available. Um, we'll continue to ask PTA and community groups. Uh, we'll provide opportunity and support if people want to come to the school to get help filling them out. Um, and again, the, the forms, every parent will be asked to fill out the form in order to get their child scheduled through Genesis in August. It's one of the ones that's there. And literally, as an electronic form, it takes about five minutes per child um, to fill out. Uh, and although we can do it by family, right? They can fill it out. Yeah. So maybe 10 minutes at, at the most uh, to be able to do, but we're going to continue to push it and encourage it. It has it has real impact for individual children and for you know, the additional services that we're able to provide for many children. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Okay. Were there any other questions? Ms. Strand. Just to clarify, so um, we're going to have uh, the next report will be on the 13th and 27th, but the, the, if there's updates, they'll be on the website for parents to view if there's any changes or anything. Yes, Ms. John. So the, the next formal report that we'll do will be on the 13th of, of July during the uh, Committee of the Whole. If there is something that's urgent uh, on the night of the 22nd of June, we will provide something. But right now, we are not scheduling a formal presentation that night because we don't expect there to be anything dramatically different between today and that evening uh, with where we are. Um, and as there's information to be able to put out to the community, as soon as we have that and it's ready to go, Mrs. Wilson will continue to, to do updates during the course of the summer, and we'll update our website so that it's on there and accessible for folks. Okay, thank you. And we also believe that, that some people, honestly, are gonna need a bit of a break as we get to the end of this month, you know? <laughs> We, we think that some people, parents, family members, you know, one of the things as, as Dr. Mahan and Mrs. Weddington and I have, have worked on these presentations with people during the course of the year, um, and as we get here on, on June the 8th, people are tired. Um, staff members are tired, parents are tired, kids are tired. You know, the, the physical and emotional toll that the last 15 months has, has taken on people has been, has been devastating in a lot of ways. People are holding it together to get to June the 18th. And we recognize that, we realize that uh, people's patience is really short. Um, you know, people are have hit a frustration level with a lot that goes on. You know, I had said last spring when we were first dealing with all of this, I was glad that my four kids are the age that they are. Uh, I know the challenges, the younger the kids are, the more attention and, and what that has meant, you know, that's gone on at, at home. Um, so we know that, you know, expect that people may just wanna walk away a bit at the end of June. Uh, and have a bit of that break. I completely understand that. And um, I hear you. Four children in, I hear you. That's what right. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're living the dream. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Was there anyone else? Before I turn it back to Dr. Malash and Ms. Giordano. Mrs. Neary, do you mind if I make one final comment? No, go right ahead. So I just wanted to chime in. And again, I know I have done this at almost every meeting where Dr. Malash and I have presented, but I just wanted to take a minute as we are transitioning to the road back to thank the members of the We Return to Learn Committee that have dedicated about a year of their time in addition to their teaching responsibilities, in addition to their own families and other obligations that they may have to helping us to craft a plan to successfully return our students back to school. Over the next few weeks, I will be acknowledging each of the members of the Return to Learn committees because without their support over the last 15 months, the presentations that you have seen the changes in the classroom that you have seen, the successful return would not have been possible. So I just would like to end on, you know, I am in extremely excited to be returning back. As um, you know, Dr. Malash said, he has four older children. I have two younger children and it is, it is a daily struggle. So I am excited to be able to present this. I am excited as a parent to be the recipient of this with two small children um, in another district. And 
I want the members of that return to learn committee to know that their work was invaluable, although scrutinized, although hard, although difficult at times, it was absolutely valued. And as a district and as a community, we will come out on the other side of this in a better place. There are definitely some practices that we will continue to maintain after the pandemic that again have made our district a better place. And I don't want that to be lost as we are moving to the road back conversation. So thank you to the members of that team and thank you, Mrs. Neary for the time. Thank you, Dr. Round of applause for the committees, right? Thank you. Thank you to everyone on the committees. Okay, thank you. Dr. Malash, I'm gonna turn it back to you for our um, Second presentation, the Alternative High School Update. Thank you, Ms. Sneary. Uh, so joining us tonight are, again, uh, Ms. Mallory, who's our Director of Special Education, and Mrs. Giordano, who is the principal at the Alternative High School. Um, many of you met Ms. Giordano when she started with us or returned home to us uh, earlier this academic year. So we spent a lot of time talking about doing an update from the Alternative High School. It's been some time uh, since we've been able to do this for the board. So I appreciate Ms. Giordano being here this evening, and I'm going to let her introduce what she's going to do and what she's going to share. Um, and I do have to say, you know, it's, it's nice for her to come on after a round of applause. I think that's always a good um, stage to set uh, for somebody. So Mrs. Giordano, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, I apologize for being late. Thank you for your patience. Um, so... We spoke with three of our seniors that had been with us over the course of all four years, um, considering that some of our kids started with us and didn't really have typical experience because of COVID. We wanted to um, tap into our students that had the most depth in their experience over time. So um, I, I have what they wrote, parts of it they wrote together. And then um, one of our students, Tara Adams, um, went off and wrote a little bit more with uh, some detailed examples. So I'll just begin with our, our three um, young humans. They said that our experiences at the Alternative High School were overall very positive. Some of the things we liked throughout our time at AHS were the service learning and school-wide optional community service trips, student government, the different spirit weeks we had winter and spring, the student accommodations, the yearbook, and the types of behavioral systems with trips to earn. With student government, it really gave us students a voice in issues of concerns or just ideas that came out and an opportunity to be heard. Um, Tara goes on to say, I really enjoyed the behavioral systems and the incentive trips because it gave us all motivation to do well. However, I did not like point card systems or digital systems. Tara also is our only student that was pulled that remained remote all throughout COVID. So the other two students have returned to the building and have been attending four days in person where Tara stayed home. So we digged a little bit deeper just to speak with her about the virtual experience. Um, she wrote, I didn't like virtual courses. I wish that I had access to foreign language. I would have loved to take French or Spanish. It would have cheered me up. Virtual courses did seem to be really stressful for me. Um, I was not pleased that I wasn't challenged as greatly on an academic level. But if I were at West, I think maybe perhaps my situation would have been worse because I wouldn't have gotten the attention that I needed. I'm different and not the best at making friends. Unlike at AHS where I met many kids who felt the same way, we all became friends. Speaking of friends, I do wish that I had been able to have more social time and activities during COVID. I'm grateful that we got to choose remote or in person, but as a remote student, I felt very lonely, outcast, and at times isolated. One of the things that I would have been, I think would have been really helpful to kids like me who can tend to be sneaky or perhaps go where we're not supposed to on our digital devices would be some kind of mandatory system to check up on student activity and their accounts to avoid activity unnecessary or prohibited. Lastly, I would like to say that I really appreciated all the teachers office hours I appreciated the final reflection instead of the exam. And I appreciated that I got to see teachers every day and there were no snow days during COVID. And that is all I have to say. So 
you know, a, different experiences. Um, our two students who were uh, with us in person will be at our graduation next week. I know some of you plan to attend um, and they also have written small things that we'll be reading on their behalf. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. It really is a special place with a very diverse group of students who, you know, do have a lot to say and do love to be heard, even though perhaps they don't always have the, um, the intensity to come on and, and be heard in front of you. Um, they're happy to write and be heard at any time and we'll continue to work with them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adana. So Mr. Adana, you'll come back and see us and invite students again next year too, yes? Yes, of course, of course. I feel like I have some sophomores that definitely would pop on and speak with you guys. My senior class is just a little bit more introverted. So, you know, I definitely think over time we can get them on. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Giordano. Okay, that now brings us to correspondence. Did anyone have any correspondence? Mr. Avadia? Yes, Mr. Neary, thank you. Um, some positive news to report. Uh, the Camden County Educational Services Commission uh, met on, hold on, hold on. Met on June 2nd and they will have us back. <laughs> so we have retained our seat on the board of directors as well as the representative assembly. Um, so kudos to us and um, yeah, after uh, uh, after the summer's hiatus, we will be back uh, in full mode, have, you know, attending each meeting now that, now that we've remained on the board of directors, starting in September. So you know, there was not um, you know could have turned out differently, but the best outcome was achieved, uh, and as a result, we have remained in good standing with this wonderful educational services commission. So that's number one. Second, I wanted to just give a brief kudos to. Uh, the Rosa Thespians uh, for their production. I was able to attend last, that was past Saturday of Disney's Descendants. And I thought to myself, you know, great, talented group of students with, uh, with these, uh, these like translucent masks so we could see them, you know, singing and you know, uh, performing so well. And, you know, art, art is prevailing in COVID, even masks. What was cool is they could interact. You know, it wasn't, they weren't on separate screens, but they were together and they did a very nice job. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avadia. Was there any other correspondence? Okay. If there's nothing else, we'll move to our first public comment, which is for board action items only, numbers 17 through 20. There will be another public comment section for any topic at the end of the meeting. Calling comments will be heard first then mailed, then emailed comments from the board secretary will be read. Each comment submitted shall be subject to the three minute time allotment. Okay, and the first one I see is Haas. So if you could please state your full name and address. Uh, yes, that is Jamie Haas and it's five Paper Mill Road, Cherry Hill. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. All right. That um, I just wanted to make a comment on the children wearing their masks in school that my daughter, she's six years old in first grade, had advised me, I guess, the window air conditioner unit in her classroom today. Ms. Haas? Um, yes. I, Ms. Haas, it's, it's Joe Malash. I apologize. This section is only for items that are listed for action on the agenda. Yes, thank you. I was just going to note well, that. I did want to just mention that the janitor didn't come in to fix the um, window air conditioner unit that was blowing out hot air into her classroom until 1125 when they were Ms. starting Ms. Rest can, workshop. Um, if you'd like, you can make that comment at the end of the meeting in the second public comment. Okay, that's fine. If you could keep me in, in queue for, for making Yes, you comments. can just raise your, your hand at the end and we will go back around. Okay, because it is very topic. concerning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoss. Okay, next we have Jill Roth Gutman. 
you state your full name, address, and agenda item. Hi, Jill Roth Gutman. Um, agenda item, I, I want to say it was number seven, the We Return to Learn. Um, I do have a couple it's questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Gutman. It's action items, 17 through 20. All other items we can address at the end in the second public comment. I thought it was everything that was supposed to already occur prior to this portion of the public comment. Isn't that the way that Robert's rules usually work? It's the action items only for the first public comment. Second public comment is for any topic item. Okay, I don't have the agenda in front of me. Is that what you're hosting? Yes. Curriculum instruction, business, business and facilities, human resource negotiations and policy and legislation. Okay, well, none of that's been addressed in the meeting so far and I've attended the entire meeting so far. So the public comment rules were then changed um, more recently since the last time we were at a meeting. So in the future, um, there should be notice about that change um, to the district and any parents or community members participating. Thank you, Ms. Scottman. Okay, and next is a telephone number. I'm, I'm not gonna read their number. Um, if you can go ahead, state your full name, address, and agenda item. Action agenda, I should say. Oh, okay, this is, my name is Jeff Potter. It's 110 Kilburn Drive, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. It's 18.4 transfer of current year surplus to capital reserve, okay? Um, whereas the, the aforementioned status authorized procedures under the authority of the Commission of Education, which permit a Board of Education to transfer unanticipated excess current revenue or unexpended appropriations into reserve accounts during the month of June by Board of Resolution and the Cherry Hill Board of Education wishes to deposit current year general fund unanticipated revenue and expended unexpe unexpended line item appropriations into a capital reserve account at the end of the year. And the Cherry Hill Board of Education has determined that up to $7 million may be available for such purpose of transfer. When they were fab when you were fabricating the new budget, there was some issue over um, needing extra funds for certain items, and that entailed a one percent increase in the tax levy, and some of the items were were dropped. Uh, since there's a surplus of seven million dollars, will 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 those items will some of those items be brought back in the budget? Uh, as opposed to just putting the seven million for capital reserve, but that's a, a fairly large surplus, which is great. But still, mobile, um, or those items that were dropped, still be dropped. I guess that's my question. Thank you, Dr. Potowitz. Okay. Okay, we'll move to submit it. Oh, there's someone else, Christina Musso. Please state your full name, address, and action agenda item. Hi, Christina Musso, 11 Scatter Good Road. I always find this part of the meeting very confusing. Um, I guess, where can we find this information in the future? Because it, you're saying action item 17 through 20, but there's a slide that says 10 to, I think, 12.6. And I just, pers this always confuses me. Is there some place that we can find this information prior to the call? It's, uh, Ms. Musso, it's, it's listed on the board agenda. If you go to the, the district website uh, and click on the tab, the Board of Education, there's a link that takes you to the board agendas. It's on board docs. Uh, and in there, you can scroll down the left-hand side of the agenda. So as an example, number nine says, first public comment board action items only, item 17 through number 17 through 20. And then it goes through the statement that talks about board action items only. Uh, each of the items that's on the agenda are numbered and they're numbered categorically. So it goes through on there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Thank you, Ms. Musso. Okay, Mrs. Sugars, did we have any submitted comments? Uh, not for the first public comment period. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, that brings us to our board work session. And up is curriculum and instruction, and I will turn that over to Mrs. Matlack. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. I was having a little problem with my mute and unmute button, but I think I've got it now. Um, no okay, we met on June 1st, and it, we were, um, two of us were in person, and we had a couple members of the community join us, as well as some of our administrators for the meeting. Um, and we had, we had uh, three items on our agenda. The first was um, a master's capstone project, Julia Loh. Hoefer Kozak, one of our teachers at Stockton, um, is doing a master's project and um, she uh, needs board approval for this. The, the project will involve uh, 2D figures and their attributes. It's currently a unit that she is teaching um, to her students. So there will be no classroom disruption. There will be no, um, you know, everything will just, from the student perspective, will run. Um, smoothly as it, you know, and she will be getting her information and following up with us at CNI in September. Um, then we had a presentation from the, our secondary school um, ad administrators, our principals, uh, Dr. Morton, Dr. Perry, Dr. Birdie, Mr. Guy, and Mr. O'Connor were at our meeting and they talked about um, the journey, part two, building momentum for the future. And this was a follow-up to our December 21st uh, presentation, uh, The Journey Part One. Um, the, pro the following areas were addressed, attendance, grades, and summer programs. Um, Cru Crucia, each, of, each of the principals addressed different areas um, and some of them overlapped, um, but we started with Crucia and Beck and they spoke about intentionality and taking thoughtful intentional steps now to build momentum for September regarding um, bringing our students back five full days, all of our students. And so things, some of the things that they are doing is outreach to families via phone calls and visits. Um, they are also doing uh, a cruci, they're doing pop-up Mustang visits, uh, which were, uh, I, I saw some of, some of the pictures, some of the tweets and um, Dr. Birdie was very enthusiastically telling us about how the students um, and the staff enjoy those visits. Um, Beck is also doing home visits and student of the month. West, East, and Rosa are doing similar outreach to families and students. And Beck and Crucy reported seeing um, an increase in their in-person student attendance to about 70% right now. Uh, West and Rosa spoke about the second and third marking period grades. <clears throat> so um, there was a 10% increase in grades of A's. And the, the principal stressed that this was not the number of students receiving those grades. It was the number of increase in the number of grades. So one student may have gotten two or three more A's than they've gotten in the past, as opposed to that 10% being increase of student numbers. The same, that same caveat goes for the, the grades of E's, and there was an increase of 5% in the grades of E's. Again, again, the number of grades, not the number of students. Most of the um, increase in E's are with students who are still remote. So the principals were telling us about um, what they're doing to help those students. The, the there's a robust INRS program involving a variety of professionals. The summer program will also be more robust, including credit recovery options at the high school level and, and additional supports that will focus on the essential required sequential classes. Dr. Morton spoke about how they are responding to the, the data and using a restorative 360 degree approach in all areas, not just with discipline. Um, and Mr. Guy spoke about the diverse representation of students and, the gra and their grades that they looked at in order to get this snapshot of students 
um, to in order to present to this material to us. Um, Dr. Perry spoke about the importance of community for students and what they are doing at the secondary level. East and West are working together with similar outreaches to students and families and the transition programs over the summer for all students. There will be transition programs in place and but especially focusing on the ninth and 10th graders because our 10th graders, there are many of them who have not been in the buildings yet at all. Um, we also had a return to learn update um, and it was, it was different than what was presented tonight. It focused on uh, the summer work and the, the ESSER II funds and how they will be used. Um, let me see. So just as a, a recap to our presentation at the last meeting, the ESSER II funds, 75% is uh, for academic enrichment. Of that 75%, 75% is for STEM classes and 25% is for literacy and the arts. And the, the remaining global 25% of the ESSER funds um, are allocated for learning ecosystems. And that includes things such as mental health, attendance, anxiety issues, SEL, social emotional learning things, and parent education courses. Um, there will be targeting support for students uh, from the teachers and many other professionals um, so that those um, and include the IR, INRS process. Um, the acceleration courses that will be offered this summer will be open to anyone to take and that will be posted in Genesis for parents to sign up their students to participate in those. 75% of those courses will be um, STEM courses. And um, when Dr. Mahan was uh, describing these to us, she was telling us how excited the staff are to be presenting these courses because um, they are uh, creative and teacher driven. So they present um, the courses and um, what they wanna do to, to Dr. Mahan and they really um, design their courses uh, for the summer. So um, there's a lot of flexibility for the teachers um, regarding that. And they will be both remote and hybrid. Um, what else? Okay, at the very end, we had um, a couple community members at our meeting. So their comments centered around uh, questions about the acceleration courses, uh, the hybrid and remote offerings, and some questions about credit recovery uh, for our high school seniors. So if there's any committee members, um, I guess that would just be Mrs. Neary um, at this point, uh, who, who was there, who has anything to add or any board members who have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer that or direct to the right person to answer that. I have nothing to add, Ms. Matlack, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Friedel, did you have your hand up? I do, Mrs. Matlack. Um, just a question. So with the INRS uh, process at the secondary level, how do students get, um, I'm going to say referred, is it through teachers? Can parents request? Like, like how do students get identified to be part of that process? I will defer that question and the answer to Dr. Mahan so that you get uh, complete and accurate information. And Mrs. Matlack, I'm going to defer to Mrs. Wethington. Mrs. So Ms. Ms. Friedel, anyone can refer. A parent can refer, a teacher can refer, a counselor can refer. The system is the same K-12. So even though they're high school students, they could even self-refer. And Mrs. Weddington, is, is there a process? Is it you just go to the guidance office? Yes. Um, yes, the guidance counselor assigned to the student would be the person that would be able to um, help the parent or the teacher or the student access the service and the process. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mrs. Weddington. Any other questions? 
Mrs. Neary, I don't see any other hands up. Do you? Okay. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matlack. Okay, that'll bring us then to business and facilities, and I will turn that over to Mrs. Schultz. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. So our business and facilities meeting met June 2nd at 545. We had a wonderful presentation by Mrs. Sugars. I will do my best to replicate in words what um, our wonderful presentation was able to provide. Uh, we had great pictures and updates, and Mr. Bart was kind enough to take some videos to give us a really, really wonderful um, presentation. So bear with me as I try to uh, describe it um, in words to all of you. So the first was the East Wall Project. Uh, we got to see really great um, photos with an update on all the walls and the classrooms. So we were able to look at the picture of both interior and exterior pictures. We saw all of the work that we were able to do utilizing our internal maintenance crews. We brightened up uh, many of the walls, the cafeteria. We've done a lot of diamond grinding on the floor and uh, a lot of painting. Um, so uh, it was great that we were able to kind of utilize our internal maintenance crews to kind of brighten up the work there. Uh, I believe we had a potential open date of this week for one of the internal walls for just to kind of open that up for students and traffic flow in the new uh, kind of connecting corridor. So that was really exciting just to hear. And the, again, the, the work that was done over at East was just um, fantastic just to see that. The next, we talked about the security. Uh, sweet installation project. So at this point, all of our elementary schools, all elementary high school, high schools, Rosa and Beck are completed. Um, we still have Perusi and Malcrest, and those two will be completed in June. So the work that's been done is our interior and exterior cameras, our door entry systems, our exterior door sensor systems, our strobe warning lights, and lockdown notification to the Cherry Hill Police. So all of that work has been completed. Again, the exception is Carusi and Malcrest, and that will be completed in June. So that work has been done um, amongst our district. The next, we talked about the roof leaks and the replacement project. So our Stockton roof will be replaced this year. That work is getting ready to begin um, on the 21st. And we'll be doing partial roof replacement at Hart, Johnson, Payne, and Rosa. And again, we have a start date on the 21st. We did talk about a small concern about getting materials uh, just due to the impact of COVID. A couple questions um, were brought up about the cost. Our cost is locked in, so we won't. We, we are not going to see any type of a cost increase if we do have troubles getting materials. If we do run into just uh, any type of a backlog of the work, our priority for the roofs, it, it will be stocked in. And we um, had a board member raised a concern about just kind of sending out communication to the neighborhoods, just letting them know that this work is about to start taking place. So we are going to be doing that. Our ESY program is going to be shifted to Woodcrest and our summer sack will be moving to man because that I believe is typically going to stop Certainly not. Woodcrest. Sorry. So we will be shifting. Oh, so then I got that wrong. I'm sorry. ESY is not shifting to Woodcrest. It is from Johnson to Woodcrest. Sorry. Sorry, apologize. So yeah, ESY will be moving to Woodcrest, Somerset, to Man, just to accommodate the schools where we're doing that roofing work at. Uh, then we had, we talked about ADA. Uh, we are starting the ADA work at West and Woodcrest. We finalized the plans June 10th, and that work is also starting um, on the 21st. And just to clarify, a lot of the reason this work is starting on the 21st is that we're waiting for school to finalize and finish and a they've got to make room for the materials to be brought into the school. So just to kind of clarify, uh, Mr. Bart explained that to us at our meeting. Uh, we did also talk about the East Tennis Court. This was damage that was done about a year ago from wind. Um, this work is going to be starting on June 14th. And we did actually talk a little bit more about this tennis court. Again, we had approved this, but um, talked a little bit about that when the wind came in, that the wind had potentially lifted the court from the surface and there were cracks that were kind of underneath the foundation. So um, the rationale behind this is that we just want to fix both. We want to go ahead and fix the cracks that are in the foundation um, and the court at the same time so that we can just extend the life of the tennis court. There was also no drainage system in this. So we're also adding a drainage system as well. 
We've already approved this entire project, but just remember that we will get reimbursed for a huge percentage back from the insurance company on this project. The last thing that we talked about was um, our safety grant. We have decided to take our safety grant and invest in a lock block. Um, and so essentially these lock blocks will replace the magnets that we are using currently uh, amongst the school. Um, we did have a pilot. This was reviewed by our health and safety committee. Um, and so we are gonna move forward with replacing magnets that are currently in use. These were piloted at Sharp School and they were well received. The block, the safe, these lock blocks are approximately $11. So we are going to go ahead and we're gonna move forward with as many as we can possibly purchase. We are gonna start with classrooms and then we'll move to other areas, administration and um, maintenance buildings and kind of move throughout the district. This first grant is approximately $35,000 that we're using um, and we will uh, get as many lock blocks as, as we can. So the question was asked, could we just fund, um, could we just take some money from our budget and just outfit all of the classrooms throughout all of the district? But, this is a smaller company that makes this out of California, and we do have a bid limit of 44,000. So we are gonna use our safety grant. We're gonna try to buy some up to our bid limit, um, and we are going to uh, also purchase some more next year so that we can outfit all of our doors or administration. But we do have that bid limit of 44,000. This is um, a unique company. It's a very small company in California that makes them. so. We're trying to work within our limitations of um, not having to send this out to bid. I hope I articulated that properly. Okay. Um, then we talked about our 2021 or 2022 projects. We talked about um, those being generators at Sharp, Payne, and Man. That only two schools that we would have remaining at this point would be West and Perusi. Those are projects that we would look to roll into a potential bond. The generator at West is extremely large. Uh, and the Carusi, we'd be looking at the asbestos abatement that needs to be done. So those are the last two from a generator's perspective. And then we talked about the next projects from an ADA being um, Beck and Thomas Payne. And then we talked about um, some, so that was kind of our update on our uh, projects that were kind of out um, in the district. Uh, then we did touch on our grant writer. So I'm gonna steal um, some of Dr. Malasha's sentiments. Um, if you want to be a grant writer, we would love to have you. We have no responses for our RFP. So um, please come to our district and be our grant writer. We would love to have you and we would love all of the money you could bring into our district. So uh, we currently have no responses. We talked about maybe why that was perhaps um, and we're gonna um, push that back out again. Um, some other general questions were just, do we have a process in place to ensure that the doors are locked? Um, do we have a checklist? We talked about our checklist, our security protocols, and then we talked about the health and safety committee. I am also happy to say that we had um, four community members at our first open community uh, meeting, and we had some questions that were surrounding, um, how is our security adjusting during COVID? We did have a question, um, what's the difference between a job rec and a request for a proposal? We had some questions um, in regards to, do our windows in our school, do they are they required that they have to be open or can they be shut? The difference of the color of the lights and how many total number of locks do we think we could purchase with the grant? And questions regarding the, some of the gravel material at East um, that was obviously um, better articulated if you could see the pictures in the presentation. Um, we asked of a clarifying question on how we were going to get that communication out to the uh, community and then just verifying that each school did have a health and safety committee. Our next meeting will be a committee of the whole, and that will be on July 13th. Are there um, any questions or any other board members that want to add to the report out? That's the I covered it all, I think. <laughs> all right, so I will roll if that's okay, Thank Mrs. Neary, right into HR. No, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so our HR committee, we met the same day, June 2nd at 5 p.m. Um, Mrs. Adrian uh, was discussed, oh, actually, I'm sorry, Mrs. Sugars discussed two positions, um, two senior account positions that we are looking to uh, post. And then Mrs. Adrian, spoke about our educational assistance 
position that is for the cafeteria and recess assistant uh, role that Dr. Malash had mentioned earlier. So again, more opportunity to work in our district. So please come on and apply. Um, and then we talked very briefly about the sidebar agreement for CHEA that is on the agenda tonight. And then the last uh, thing that we discussed was it just an update on recruitment. So as of June 2nd, these numbers um, probably are very fluid and could have changed. But as of June 2nd, we had 34.4 openings uh, in the district. And Mrs. Adrian had just let us know that we are moving along uh, very nicely with our recruitment efforts for next school year. So with that, I will also ask for any uh, questions from my other fellow committee members. Um, there were no uh, committee uh, community members at our HR meeting, so uh, no public comment. Uh, our, also, HR will not be meeting in July, so HR will be skipping the month of July. We will resume in August. So with that, any, uh, any questions? Uh, yes, Mrs. Stratton. Ms. Schultz, I just want to clarify too for HR for the community. That's that was the one community that will remain closed to public, correct? Because of personnel. Sure. Yeah, great point. Yeah, that committee yes. will will absolutely always remain closed to the public. So yes, good point. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. All right. Well, I will turn it back to you, Mrs. Deary. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Schultz. Next, we have policy and legislation. I'll turn that over to Ms. Friedel. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Neary. Uh, so our elected uh, um, uh, uh, senators and assembly people were very busy in the month of May. Uh, Mrs. Weathington had quite a list of pending or proposed legislation um, that was uh, introduced. Um, I will just highlight several of them. Um, there is a, a bill introduced uh, that would allow for unscheduled surprise inspections of uh, buses. Um, there also what is um, legislation to allow for preferred names to be placed on diplomas. Um, Another uh, proposed piece of legislation is for the for DCF and DOE to establish a child abuse and neglect um, committee. Uh, is that correct, Mrs. Weathington? I'm trying to read my notes. <laughs> um, yes, yes, okay. you're correct. Uh, there was quite a bit of legislation, different pieces that focused on social emotional learning. Um, uh, there was also legislation for um, it related to that for guidance counselors to have professional development on uh, social emotional learning. Um, a uh, a um, legislation to have the commissioner of education report on learning loss during the pandemic. Um, another uh, piece is to have a baseline concussion. Uh, assessments on all 6th through 12th graders who are playing sports. Um, also, uh, legislation on Asian heritage being incorporated uh, into the curriculum. Uh, there also was uh, the Clayton model, which is a social emotional pilot K-5. That was actually uh, approved um, but it will not affect us. We are not part of that pilot. Um, it is specific districts throughout the state. Um, and the governor did sign into law the ability to hire substitutes with uh, 30 credits. Did I get the credits right, Mrs. Weathington? 30. Yes. Uh, yes, 30, because the current is 60. So yes. it's, it's changed to 30. Right. Yes. So that will um, increase the pool of substitutes uh, is the hope I, uh, for districts. Um, next, we were informed that the county commissioners who did not end, uh, do the visit in the spring, they are planning to come in the fall. We do not have a date yet. Mrs. Cohen is working on a date. Um, today, uh, Cherry Hill East was fully virtual because today was a, an election day and Cherry Hill East was used as a polling location. And we are not allowed to have students in buildings when it is um, a, a polling place. So just a couple of pieces to note is that um, 
districts cannot refuse to be a polling place. So if it, if the uh, the request comes in, then the district must honor it. So I just, uh, Dr. Malash let us know that they are looking at November 2nd um, and the possibility if they want to use any of our schools for polling places, then we will have to potentially relook at our calendar because we are intending to be open uh, for in-person learning obviously on November 2nd. So um, there is not a date that they need to notify the district, but Dr. Malash is working with uh, the county, uh, the Board of Elections, and would hope to know by the end of summer what the status is. Um, we also moved on and had a conversation about renaming the Barclay Early Childhood Center uh, to uh, the Estelle Malberg Early Childhood Center, and you will see that that is a resolution um, on the agenda uh, with the intent of being voted at the work, I mean, the action uh, meeting. Um, we did ask, uh, it was asked of Dr. Malash if um, the school was named after a individual uh, to our Knowledge to Dr. Malash's, it is named after the neighborhood as opposed to an individual person. Um, we also had a conversation. Uh, there was a request from a middle school student or, or the coach or, or a teacher from one of the private middle schools to allow uh, non-public school students to participate in middle school sports. Um, we had a lot of dialogue. We had questions that Dr. Malash was going to take back to um, uh, the athletic director um, and, and as well as Mr. Green uh, to, to see um, what that would mean um, looking at those schools that those sports that have cuts versus uh, sports where there are no cuts, um, transportation, um, time frame, you know, do the private schools end the same time that our middle schools end? How would they uh, participate? Um, Mrs. Wethington did note that there is the process for um, the uh, student activity fee, but one of the other things to consider is the harassment, intimidation, and bullying that if an incident were to occur and they're a non-public school student, the, the challenges of that dynamic. So we do not have any recommendations. Uh, we are waiting for some more information that will be brought back to the committee and then we will share that out with you. Um, we also uh, took a, a quick um, initial conversation about the care of school property policy um, and specifically the ability or the, the provision that uh, if there are balances on the meals that the school may um, withhold uh, certain activities from students. Um, we are going to uh, re revisit the conversation in August and we plan to come back to the board as a whole with a full on discussion and uh, recommendations. The uh, last item was we did have a conversation about current DOE, New Jersey DOE and CDC uh, requirements um, on certain things like masks. But as Dr. Malash said in his presentation that things move very quickly. So, you know, in a week, um, <laughs> everything can change. Uh, as of now, as Dr. Malash shared earlier, uh, the requirement for mask is still in effect for September. Um, so that is how the plan is moving forward. However, if guidance changes, then the district will, will pivot and change with the guidance. Um, we also were talking about the playground equipment um, and the requirements for right now, it has been that it has to be cleaned in between use and there hasn't been that ability to do that, but it sounds like there is new guidance that makes that more available for September. Um, we also uh, talked about the, um, the written 
or emailed uh, public comment. And as long as we are in a hybrid setting, we have to allow for the emailed uh, and mailed public comment. Once we resume full in-person meetings, at that time, the written submitted emailed public comment will uh, cease to be part of our process. And I, we also um, had four uh, items that are up for second reading this evening. Uh, it's, it looks like two came from CNI, the Every Student Succeed Act complaints, and the Title I, I'm sorry, the Title I fiscal responsibilities. We had one that came from HR, the employment of support staff members. And we had the other one that we discussed last time uh, from PL on the service animal uh, policy. Uh, members of the committee. Oh, let me also say that we did have three. Uh, community members in attendance. Um, Ms. Stratton, Mr. Avadia, and I were in person. Ms. Arroyo was not able to attend that meeting. Um, so we actually had a meeting without using a computer because we were, <laughs> we were all in the room. Um, and we did have a, a couple of uh, just questions. Uh, one that came up was about the food program and, and the food balance that we've, we've had. And um, the parent was uh, an elementary parent and uh, made the suggestion that we look at a, um, I'm sorry, a debit, uh, a credit system as opposed to a debit system. So students um, have the money, they take them, they, they use the money and they can't purchase more and there's no balance. Um, but also to make sure that parents are aware um, that uh, they can reach out to the school lunch room, the cafeteria, and put limits on what their children can buy. They can say no, no ice cream or ice cream once a week um, so that there is some parent ability, but you do have to reach out to the school and, and make those requests. Um, another uh, comment was an appeal that we appeal to, um, I guess, the governor to rela relax the mask mandate um, since we need to follow the guidance of the state. Anything else from the committee members uh, and then any questions from the board? I can't see Mr. Avadia, so if he has his hand up, somebody has to tell That's me. Great job. He, he <laughs> <not that's> <laughs> Uh, okay, seeing none. Strategic planning, Mrs. Neary. Thank you, Ms. Friedel. I will now turn it over to Mr. Avadia for strategic planning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Friedel and Mrs. Neary. Um, okay, strategic planning met on uh, June 2nd, and uh, it was a quite a meeting. So we returned in person, uh, three of us were, um, three of the board members were in person. Mrs. Tong joined us remotely um, and then the administration was, was split. Uh, but anyway, it was good to, uh, yeah, it was a good, good feeling. We talked briefly, we sort of debriefed the conversation we'd had as a full board about the bond and came to the conclusion, I think, unanimously between the board members, president and administration, that the only thing to do um, based on the majority wanting to move forward and the people who you know had some concerns needing more information that we needed to as a committee really engage in getting that more information. And so that since we had taken some delay, we needed to sort of make up some ground um, on this. And so the meeting moved awfully quickly, um, but, it, but, it, but in the best possible way. Um, Mrs. Neary brought up issues of touring buildings. Everyone seemed to think that was a good idea. Um, but we then centered on kind of like, all right, where do we go from here? And um, there were a lot of good, good, good items discussed. Um, we talked about categorizing the work, uh, whether that's site work, ADA, playgrounds, electrical, roofing, um, focusing in on some of the really critical needs that will be left after the current plans um, for the buildings. 
to focus on um, HVAC. That's another one that really came up. Bathrooms and all-purpose rooms, security. A lot, a lot, a lot of good, a lot of good characterization options. Um, look at educational spaces that could be included. Steam, media centers. Um, we talked about engaging in the building, and so we talked about uh, administration actually through, through Dr. Malash talking to school principals and their teams, and really getting a sense before we went to the, the, the more public conversations of means testing, you know, what makes sense, what's missing that we're not thinking of, what's in there that maybe isn't a must have. Um, we talked about timeline. And so this is something we frequently do in committee. You know, We've talked about redistricting, we've talked about bond. Uh, next month in committee of the whole, we'll talk about the timeline of both to gain some more understanding about that. Um, and kind of to look at that in time, because there, I think on the community level, as we discovered later in the meeting, there is some confusion that, that, that that's sort of easy to resolve. Um, we talked about, okay, hold on. we talked about the difference in going out for bond conceptually from the last time. One example is there isn't a tax neutral uh, option uh, that the previous board had felt was important. Um, and I asked the question about, you know, when do we start thinking about number of questions and, and items like that and exact dollar amount? And everyone seemed unanimous in saying, this is not the time. Um, we really need to go to building levels. We really need to engage uh, community. And so we talked about, like, so just conceptually, we talked about the board playing a vital role starting, I think, in August or September in being part of building level discussions um, with those building communities. Um, and so that's where I asked Mr. Garrison to kind of help sketch that out for us. You know, what, what, is it, what does a meeting like that look like? You know, what's, what's his role? What's the board member's role? What's the administration role? Um, and thinking about doing this, you know, in a very, um, in a very powerful way, but one that is, that's choreographed based on Bob's expertise in wanting to kind of you know, put a new, uh, new spin on this. We talked about key communicators. Um, we talked about the fact that discussions are happening in the, in the community, uh, which we think many of them are very positive, especially what's coming out of fair funding and zone PTA in that regard. Um, and then it seemed, it seemed like, uh, like kismet because fair funding has a lorry. We have a lorry. It seemed like those lorries should get together. So. A few jokes later, we thought that was probably a good idea, maybe September, maybe before, but that at least we could start to, you know, get a sense of, of, of where that's going. We talked about tours, if I didn't mention that already. Um, Mrs. Wilson contributed that uh, HVAC does seem to be something that the community is starting to center around, at least um, in the discussions that are having, happening through that fair funding group. Um, we did talk once again about the board really being in front of this and not leaving it to administration to carry the water alone, as was the perception the last time around. Um, we talked about we talked about the conceptual alignment between the lack of fair funding over essentially thirty years in Cherry Hill and the need for a bond, and trying to really message that appropriately and well. We talked about potentially even getting involved in uh, events over the, um, the summer, or at least supporting those who would get involved in those events. And that's where I said, we've got this amazing resource, Paul Green, who can very nicely sketch out for us before we get into the bond, what the parameters for board members are, off discussed, um, and we just need to come to, to a certain set. I mentioned to the committee that I would like to be in favor of the board, but only if Paul says that's okay. So. We need to figure that part out. And you went on mute, Mr. Avadia. Oh, our bond development. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's just getting um, Okay. That was sort of the, the part and parcel. Um, and then of course we had four community members. I would like to say of these community members, I believe they were very much for the bond. 
Um, and we're interested in asking some questions that I believe were addressed in the room, uh, including, you know, the difference between uh, building new schools and, you know, repairing uh, existing schools and what the cost differentials would be. Now, this is one of the things that came up. In time as currently conceived, at least personally, the difference between redistricting, which would be a plan that we'll start to see in August, uh, that we'd like to, if at all possible, resolve by October, if that's possible, we're still means testing that. But that issue from the public discussion perspective, and well, it's not really a public vote, but the public's day for that is separated about a year between the public's vote as currently conceived on bond. What's happening though in our discussions is they seem to be happening at the same time. And in some sense, some of the work is, but the, you know, the, the, the public presentation and interface is very different. For instance, just to just put it out there, redistricting, we've already had a town hall and thought exchanges on that issue. We've not done that on the bond because the bond of course does not exist. So, there are some things that are similar and different. I believe Committee of the Whole, and I, I think the whole committee agreed with me that Committee of the Whole next month strategic planning is a great time to really start putting definition timelines and work plans in a draft format out to the full board because I think one thing that we did feel after the last board discussion is strategic planning, not by design and not by intent, but we're operating on more information and we've sat with more information than the full board has. One of the reasons is that strategic planning takes an hour and a half. My report out typically takes longer than everyone would like, but at, at least five to 10 minutes. There's a huge time differential. So um, anyway, we want to start aligning the full board with what we have come to know as strategic planning so we truly can be with one voice someday soon. Okay. Um, we talked, you know, the members of the public talked about engaging realtors, engaging elementary parents, um, and really about building and, and continuing a path forward um, that was perhaps as methodical, but that was a lot more work intensive, really starting um, this, at this particular meeting. And so it was a lively discussion and you know, a lot of good follow-ups. And I think, um, I think we all felt positive at the end of the discussion. And so that's, that's more or less my report. So I would say for other members of the committee, anything I've missed or haven't given enough time to or anything like that. Or gotten wrong. Sorry. Ah, Mrs. Neary. Um, yes, and apologies because I don't feel very well, and I will turn this over to Ms. Friedel soon. Um, if I recall, we had said, Mr. Avadia, that we would back into a timeline so the full board could see next month if we do this on this date month, right? Roughly, it then takes you to this step in the process, to that step, to the next, to the election for the bond so that the board could understand because it's kind of a, a mythical idea in that way of what the, the timing really looks like because it, it seems like it's further away, I think, for the board as a whole than the reality of what needs to happen to hit an election date you know, within 2022 uh, and yeah. the end of of 2022 and then the what the redistributing of the schools would look like because that is something with a shorter lift than the timeline for the bond and there would be some gap between the two as was discussed and you know questions and concerns were raised so I think that was some of the other discussion um, that happened. Yeah yeah one of the most quotable quotes of the meeting was Dr. Malash saying that the the, um, the bond referendum timelines are state imposed. We don't have local control over that. Uh, we have to submit projects to the state. We have to get the blessing of all sorts of people outside of district. We bring that back. It takes just a much longer period of time. The, the, um, the redistricting is really self-imposed. Um, although there are some dates to be aware of, but, but essentially, yes, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right is that we'll see next month in Committee of the Whole that the two paths really diverge. Even if we start both discussions in August, one possibly could conclude by October, maybe a little bit later. The other one really, by the time we get it back uh, and packaged um, from the state would be you know, 
in the late summer. You know, so even even just those two data points are um, you know are nine months apart, and, and so that'll be that'll be clear, I think, in in, in time. So, Ms. Schultz. Yeah, I just, I just have a couple of things. I think I I think what I was going to say, uh, Miss Neary was 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 kind of was saying, but um, I think for me, what what I can't wrap my head around is 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 timelines like. The, the timeline in regards to like if we intend to pass this bond um or put it on the ballot on x date like i for me i i need to back i need to work backwards from that day of we need to have it submitted by x we need to have community feedback by x we need to have the board needs to sell the administration we want to do whatever projects abc by x day and that for me is what's been missing in all of these discussions and so i don't know if miss neary you're trying to say that's what we're finally going to get to at the committee of the whole meeting but for me i feel like we're already weeks behind and that yes we're pushing this we, we're pushing this bond further and further out like so that i think that's what i heard is that that's yeah. that's the discussion we're going to have on july 13th but for me those timelines are like critically and so critically important because I just don't see us making the deadline. That's one. I'm also, I mean, I, I've sat here and I've, I know I've been mildly quiet, but I'll speak up because I said I wasn't for the bond at the last meeting, but like, I still don't know what we're all, like, I don't know, we've had so many discussions. And so I would like to kind of get an understanding of like, like what is strategic planning's recommendation to the board as far as like, in the meetings, because you're right, you guys meet for an hour and a half, two plus meetings. Like, is is that recommendation from you or from Garrison coming on July 13th as well? Or like, hey, we have this long range plan. We know every single thing that is wrong in every single one of our buildings. So now what are we doing with that information? Like, that is what I can't put together in my head. Like, if we have this long range plan that tells us every single thing that is wrong with our buildings. I don't see the need to take a tour. I don't need to see it. I know it from the architect that we're paying money to put that report together. So in my opinion, like I, that's what I'm looking for is like that concrete recommendation from strategic planning because you are the, the committee that has been talking about it to say our recommendation are let's discuss a, B, C, D projects is our recommendation. So I don't know when that conversation is taking place. So that yeah. for me is what I need to wrap my head around to get to kind of move this forward. Yeah, let me, you know, Ms. Sugars is, is the expert, but let me take a step. Sure. Next month, I, I think the dis a discussion is the wrong way to think about it. Next month, Mr. Sugar is going to present us timelines for what we would be talking about if we moved along naturally on this path that would get us to September and December of 22 for a public vote. Okay. I agree with you. Based on where we are from a momentum perspective, based on we're probably, we've lost ground, you know, since we started talking about this when I was a young man. Um, <laughs> the second piece is we're gonna get the full listing of projects by the end of January 22. By that point, we will have scoped out because the piece that's missing essentially is the building level engagement with the principals and the school communities, and also what the public is willing to bear. Just because we have, you know, $360 million of projects doesn't mean the public will support them. What we need to do, I think, over the course of months is get a sense from the public, what will they support? And then the other factor is we can, as you're doing, you know, in your committee, uh, pull some money for priority projects. I wish we were further along. Don't get me wrong. Um, we're not. So I, I would say we'll start to get a real sense of projects probably October, November, okay. solidifying it to submit to the state January 22. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%, um, and I wish it wasn't the case, nor do I feel phenomenal about hitting September 22 for sure. I don't think, I mean, but, but we're still keeping hope alive. But the clarity, I, did I comfort, I mean, I've, clarifying that correctly with what I heard from Ms. Deary, like that is the plan for the committee of the whole is that kind of that timeline sequence. So then we have a better understanding of that kind of backing into like by X month, 
is when we should be seeking community engagement by X month is when we need to have stuff nailed down. Like that's that's kind of the discussion for the committee of the whole. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yes, not the project level, Mrs. Schultz. No, but the timeline level, at yes. least of yes. like outlining like this is the timelines when we need to hit these marks to to get the September 2022 bond. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That yes, the, the okay. committee as a whole had the same sense of pause around the urgency regarding the timeline and that everybody understand that. And then some of the um, conversation also was around getting that community engagement early and what Mr. Garrison had suggested and talked about was starting with that building level um, input and outlining and that's some of what Mr. Ovadia was referring to. So these are like the four key things and outlining that and taking it to the community is the outline, but it is not the project list, right? Like it's the outline and then you would have the projects under that, but getting the buy-in before you go all the way through that effort. So July and August are the, the timeline and what does that outline look like? And that's some of the conversation. If I remember it, Mr. Body, and forgive me, I don't feel well, but um, that's what I recall. And then the, the redistribution effort in August to review to finalize by October. Okay, thank you. That, I think that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Ms. Friedel? Mr. Abadi, could you, I'm sorry, I, I wanna make sure I understand. So the redistricting conversation is going to begin in August or? No, so I, 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 I don't know, you know, I guess Mrs. Mahan said that, uh, or I'm sorry, Dr. Mahan said that, you know, words matter. I don't think it's a discussion. I, I think what we do in, in August is we review a plan that administration has prepared. Okay. We've already had discussions. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's just a little bit different, but I, I think you're on the right level. Yes. In, in August, we'll be, we'll be back to redistricting. The problem is we got to a point, at least I felt in the conversation where we needed a plan because conceptually we had kind of the, the mojo to, to continue on. Okay, so the plan will be presented in August from the administration. That's where we are tentatively right now, yes. It's, okay. you know, when the discussion took place this winter with the board, yes. um, without, without hiring folks from the outside to come in and just do it completely, we were not in a place, um, you know, as, as budgets being prepared, we're, we're going through the end of the year, not in a place to assign staff members to uh, engage in doing that. So we'll have a better idea where we are mid-July uh, in the discussions and, and what can be accomplished in what time frame. Thank you. Okay. Well, back to back to you, Mrs. Neary. I, I think Mrs. Neary wants me to take over. Yes. Mr. Dell, <laughs> um, back to you. So, so back to me. So we will move to the special action agenda, starting with curriculum and instruction. Mrs. Matlack. Yes, thank you. Okay, the superintendent recommends and I move the following. Number one, approval of attendance at conferences and workshops for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, two, approval of out of district student placement for 2021-2022 school year. And three, approval of master capstone project. Do I have a second? Mrs. Schultz, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. All right, the online voting has been opened up. Board members, you can cast your votes. Mrs. Sugars, I think I have to abstain. Okay. Since I wasn't at the meeting last week. Okay. All right, so other than uh, Ms. Arroyo's abstention, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, next is business and facilities, Mrs. Schultz. Thank you, Mrs. Friedel. Uh, the superintendent recommends and I move the following. Number one, approval of bill list. Number two, resolution for the award of bids. Number three, resolution to approve the submission for the 2021 safety grant program. Number four, transfer of current year surplus to capital reserve. And number five, approval of the Cherry Hill Campus Police Department standing orders. Do I have a second? Mr. Avadia, are there any questions? Uh, Ms. Friedel. 
Um, I do I do have a question. I, I want to go back to the um, 18.4, the, the transfer of the current year surplus to capital reserve, and make sure I recall correctly from last year. Once funds are transferred to capital reserve, they can only be used for specific type projects. Is, is that correct? Correct. So going to the question that was raised earlier, have we allocated any funds to cover any of the budget cuts that came out when we uh, approved the budget? No. Um, so we won't actually know what this number looks like until we get through our audit process. So we probably won't know what this number truly looks like until November or December. Um, this is a, a, a resolution that we do each year just so that we have the ability to transfer the funds. We don't have to transfer the funds, but it gives us the ability to do it. Um, it's also going to be interesting to see with the uh, raising of fund balance from 2% to 4%, kind of how that affects our budget. So we're going to want to take a close look at that as well, particularly as we plan for the following year's budget. The few items that we ended up cutting were fairly minimal in terms of um, what we had to cut, what we were able to cover with some additional fund balance, and then also some of the HEAC that we're now going to be able to cover with some of our grant funding, um, which came in handy and was very timely as well. So there really is not you know, any kind of large project that we're looking to reinstate at this point. Um, if we did decide that we wanted to use some of those funds, that would be a board resolution process because our budget has already been finalized. Mm -hmm. um, but, but really the purpose of this resolution is just to give us the ability to transfer those funds once we understand where we stand financially at the conclusion of our audit. Okay, thank you. So just to say it back, so we are proving the ability to do the transfer. The actual amount will come later in the late fall. Yes, um, this gives us up to 7 million, which I know sounds like a large number, but when you look in terms of our budget and our overall spending, it is a fairly small percentage of our overall budget. Um, and so that number could change, we, it could go up, and if it does, we'll, we'll do an adjusting resolution at that time. Um, if, it, if it's less than that, then we're covered by this resolution here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions from board members? Okay. Seeing none, Mrs. Mrs. Sugars. All right, I'm gonna open up the online voting. So board members, you can cast your vote. And Mrs. Sugars, I need to abstain to Bayada Home Health on the bill list, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Schultz, human resources. Did you finish, Mrs. Sugars? I'm sorry. Um, she just, she just needs to announce the result. Miss Fung, there we go. Okay, so we have a unanimous <laughs> vote other than uh, Mrs. Schultz's um, abstention on Viata. Okay, I apologize. Uh, Mrs. Schultz, human resources negotiations. Yep, thank you again. Uh, the superintendent recommends that I move the following. Number one, termination of employment certificated. Number two, termination of employment non-certificated. Number three, appointments certificated. Number four, appointments non-certificated. Number five, assignment salary change certificated. Number six, assignment salary change non-certificated. Number seven, other compensation certificated. Number eight, contract renewal certificated. And number nine, approval of sidebar agreement. May I have a second? Mr. Avadia, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Alrighty. Once again, online voting is open. Board members, you may cast your votes. And we have a unanimous vote. Okay, policy, <laughs> policy and legislation. The superintendent move, uh, recommends, and I move the following, 20.1, approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions. Uh, do I have a second? Ms. Stratton, any comments or questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, online voting is open. Mr. Sugars, I think I should abstain from these two. 
since it was on the same. No, these aren't. I don't abstain to these. Okay, never mind. Okay, and we have um, eight yes votes and, or I'm sorry, seven yes votes and one no vote. No, Mr. Sugars, I'm trying to change it to a yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll change it for you. How, how about that? <laughs> there we go. Okay, we have a unanimous yes vote. Uh, strategic planning, we don't have anything uh, on the schedule. So now new business. Is there any new business this evening? Okay, uh, any old business? Okay, so we are going to move to second public comment. Um, this is the sub second public comment section for any topic. Calling comments will be heard first, then mailed or emailed comments to the board secretary will, will be read. Each comment shall be subject to the three minute time allotment. We will ask you to state your name and address, and uh, we will begin uh, as I see the list. And the first caller is Haas. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, this is Jamie Haas. It's five Paper Mill Road, Cherry Hill. And that, um, as I had stated earlier, that my daughter's classroom the, the air conditioner window unit had broken, I guess was blowing out hot air. And they had had field day today, came back in the classroom, did music class. And then at that time before their um, writer's workshop, which started at 1125, um, the janitor came in to be able to fix the window unit. At 930 this morning, I had checked the temperature and it was 83 degrees with a feel like degree of 90. And it was 86 degrees at 11 o'clock. So between 11 and 12, the temperature had also gone up to, I believe, 89. Um, the feel like temperature would have been higher. And so not only were they in that classroom wearing masks, but they had come in from field day, even though they were unmasked outside, they were masked in the classroom after heavy physical activity. And the other school districts across the state, let alone the country, but in the state, Tom's River, Medford, to name a couple, have lifted the mask mandate in classrooms because of the heat for the remainder of the school year, which is like a week and three days. And I believe that Cherry Hill should do the same. That yes, they fixed the window unit, but it's still a window unit. That it's one window unit in an entire classroom with high ceilings and excessive heat, it, even just over the last three days that it's been with heat index is up to the high 90s. And that I feel that the children are, are suffering with their masks. My daughter looked like she had melted when she came out of the classroom and she was still sweaty. And this was just walking from the front door to where the bus loop is, which is maybe 50 to 100 feet in distance. And that she had melted um, because the classrooms were so hot. And the other school districts have raised this issue and they've decided against the mask because of this. Um, Ms. Friedel had said that they had sent a letter to the governor requesting guidance on the mask, but the governor just yesterday said that even in the classrooms that if there's excessive heat over 79 degrees, the mask can be removed. And I have a hard time believing that it wasn't over that temperature in the classroom this afternoon at 1130 when the air conditioner was fixed. Oh, by the way, my daughter is only six years old and in first grade. So she doesn't have a cell phone or something like that to be able to check the temperature app or you know anything. When she had originally asked the gym teacher if she could take off her mask when Dr. Malosh had um, originally taken the steps to say they could take them off in gym class or outside in extreme temperatures that the gym teacher just kind of dismissed her. And it wasn't until I told her that she just could during gym class and the teacher didn't say anything. It was Thank only you. this Thank week you. that they decided to make that change outside. Thank you, Mrs. Haas. We appreciate your comments. Uh, next is L. Please state your name and address. 
Yes, uh, my name is Mr. Stokes. I live on uh, Chaucer Place, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, my question is in regards to uh, the kindergarten uh, orientation. Uh, my son will enter the kindergarten for the school year 2021-2022. I wanted to get an update and status on uh, kindergarten orientation. And uh, will we, would it be in person? Will it be remotely online? Um, will we at that time be able to um, meet our son's uh, teacher for next year? I understand you guys do a lot of transition and things like that, um, but pretty much kindergarten uh, orientation. Thank you, Mr. Stokes. Uh, next, we have Stephanie Graff. Please state your name and address. Hi, Stephanie Graff, 514 Queen Anne Road. Um, just had a question on the um, conversation you guys had about the middle school student request from a non-public high school. Just a couple of things. I think that even though we have some sports like cross country and track at the middle school level that are non-cut, they're non-cut, but they separate those kids into two colors so that, you know, even so the kids that are in that school and have been going to that school may only get to go to three meets a year or something like that. So even if it's a no cut sport, I still think it limits the opportunities of our own kids in our schools. And I would say the other thing is, is even at the high school level, if that continues, where we may have sports that are non cut right now, the addition of the B teams in the last two years has increased the, the flow of kids and the number of kids that are playing at the middle school level to come up to the high school levels. So I think that you're gonna see those numbers increase at the high school level now that B teams are back. And I just think it's important just because something's no cut doesn't mean that everyone's playing every single time. And so you really are putting our kids that are, that are in district at a big disadvantage if you're gonna allow that policy to go forward. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Graff. Next is Brooke. Hi, my name is Brooke Einbinder. I live at 30 North Syracuse Drive. I have a sixth grader at Rosa and I just wanted to talk about the redistricting. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but I just want you to know like as a current sixth grader, he started middle school remotely and then eventually got hybrid. And then hopefully next year we'll have a normal school year, but according to your redistricting, then in eighth grade, he will get switched or his friends will get switched to a different school. And I think it's important not just only to look at like dates that you would like it done by, but the overall experience of like a current sixth grader in the Cherry Hill Public Schools for middle school will be very disjointed from sixth through eighth grade if you follow the timeline that you're saying I'm not opposed to changing the districting but I think you should try to also think about the current sixth graders that are there that have been through such trauma and that maybe they could have like a continuous seventh and eighth grade year at least thank you thank you <clears throat> miss uh, uh, Carolina Bavad David, I'm sorry. That's okay. Carolina Bevid, 1213 Cropwell Road. I am very tired of Cherry Hill leading from behind. We need more leaders who think ahead and lead with courage and confidence. Our district was swift to enforce a lockdown and follow stringent CDC guidelines to the letter. But now that CDC guidelines are loosening and the governor is empowering districts to make their own rules, we are moving at a glacial pace to roll back restrictions. Not only are government agencies giving this relaxed guidance, but facts prove that everything Cherry Hill is still doing, such as intermittently masking and obsessively disinfecting surfaces is wrong or unnecessary. So either our leadership doesn't keep up with current data, doesn't understand it, or is too paralyzed with fear to make rational decisions. Indisputably, children are in more danger when they are in a car or swimming than they are from COVID. In fact, the second leading cause of death for adolescents after car accidents and before drowning is a firearm-related injury, 
Yet here we are letting masked adults wander all over school property while kids are outside at all hours. Why have we decided to pull back on safety procedures that protect kids from actual threats in order to keep them safe from the overestimated threat of COVID? How is any of this sensible? The justification for all of these procedures was flimsy in the beginning of the year, but now it's downright ludicrous. Are we proud of the school environment that we've created for kids this year, where they're not allowed to play, see smiles, or touch books, where classrooms are curiously draped in clear plastic and kindergartners can't sit next to each other and gym teachers teach from behind a computer while equipment sits untouched? I'd love to hear a logical explanation for why any safety measures are still in place when New Jersey is no longer in a state of emergency and schools throughout the country have gone back to normal but sadly, I know there is no logical explanation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, next is Jill Roth Gutman. Please state your name and address. Jill Roth Gutman, Woodcrest. Um, first, I wanna thank the teachers and the staff and our principal over at Woodcrest. Um, they've really done an amazing job this year. Uh, I do have a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted to talk about, so I'll try to uh, just start with some of the questions. Um, since almost no questions were asked about the re-return to learn, um, will lockers be utilized for middle and high school students? Are they all in working order right now? Will social distancing still occur in the classroom, three to six feet apart? Is that going to occur? Since children under 12 are not vaccinated, will there be different requirements at each of the school levels? If a child or staff member needs to quarantine, will remote live instruction be offered? It would be amazing if it was recorded live instruction um, for students that are absent. This has been offered all year in Franklinville from students. Um, they're able to rewatch instruction um, or when they're uh, struggling or when they're absent. Um, will Chromebooks be distributed district-wide again um, for, uh, for students? I'm also relieved to see some outdoor options for on the lunch level for elementary schools. Um, I didn't see this for the middle or high school levels. Um, and those uh, older children are more at risk than the younger ones. So I'm curious why that wasn't part of the plan. Um, when uh, will the middle school tours be available for children entering middle school. Um, I also agree with the comments that uh, Stephanie had placed on the record about um, not permitting the private school children to participate in our school sports. If a parent wants their child to participate in public school sports, they should enroll their child in public school. Um, I also am in favor of phased redistricting approach. So not to move the uh, middle schoolers who start middle school switching them from one middle school to another, let them have some stability, especially after this year. Um, and I'd also like to uh, see a permanent change for pushing back the start time for high school students. The Institute of Education Science and the National Center for Education Statistics reports 43% of schools, of high schools across the country start between eight o'clock and 8.39. Um, and, they, and the CDC actually recommends a later start time of 8.30 or later. Um, we've been following CDC guidelines all year, but I did not see this guideline being followed for the re We Return to Learn. Um, there's a lot of data to support that. Um, and uh, well, my time's up, so thank you. Thank for you. Comments. Thank you. Uh, Christina Musso, please state your name and add. Hi, Christina Musso, 11 Scatter Good Road. Um, thank you for tonight's presentation. It was very helpful. The approach to, be, to, to illness in children next year is a multifaceted issue that will have significant downstream impacts because children will not have the ability to attend school virtually. Last week, one of my sons had a fever, so I kept both him and his brother home from school. At the pediatrician, he was diagnosed with strep throat. My doctor's office does not offer the rapid COVID screen, but the doctor did do a PCR test as a precaution. Although it is possible that my son could have had both COVID and strep throat at the same time, the doctor said that the likelihood was very low and in her clinical experience, a rare occurrence. In her medical opinion, because no one in the home had been exposed to anyone with COVID, she did not see a reason why I had to keep the well child home a second day. 
Without knowing how long the results would take, I attempted to get a rapid COVID test and an urgent care but they would not do one without an exam and the doctor deeming it medically necessary, which brought up a whole bunch of insurance questions and coverage issues since my son had already been seen by his pediatrician earlier in the day. Until last week, I was not aware that if anyone in a household is presenting certain or a combination of symptoms, a negative COVID test for the symptomatic person is required before a child can return to school. This is applicable even if the symptomatic person has not been exposed to a person with COVID. The daily checklist does not point this out, nor is the information available on the district site. I only learned this after the school nurse sent me a link to the New Jersey Department of Health Public Guidelines recommendations, where there's a footnote on page 19. In addition, this requirement does not address the fact that parents or older children have access to vaccinations. I have no problem with this year's approach as children have the option to attend school remotely, but it got me thinking about next year. As restrictions are lifted and we return back to some sort of normalcy, along with parents returning to the workplace, the rate of children getting sick with cold, strep throat, ear infections, et cetera, is going to increase. In many instances, these can cause low-grade fevers, coughs, congestions, which result in loss of taste or smell. In the past, physicians have attributed these symptoms to common colds and viruses and tell you to wait a couple of days to be seen or bring a child in for examination. As a result, if a negative COVID test for a symptomatic person in a household is required for a child to return back to school, this could take several days unless rapid tests are steadily, readily available without doctor's signos. Um, I'm running out of time, but I just want to say that, you know, this may be a moot point if the medical community's approach is going to change. But with vaccination rates increasing, there's also a chance that insurance companies may change their policies on what's covered and when. So, um, I just would like you guys to take this into account when coming up with, with next year. And I have some other questions that I can forward at a later time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next is Lauren Greenberg. Please state your name and address. Hi, Lauren Greenberg, 508 Brian Drive. Um, I wanna start by saying that I really hope um, Dr. Blosh will address some of the questions and issues that are being brought up tonight. Um, a lot of times after these comments, um, he doesn't say anything. And as you can see, there are obviously a lot of questions and concerns, particularly around We Return to Learn for next year. I actually think it's really shameful that there were only two questions from the Board of Ed um, regarding this presentation. I can think of 10 right off the top of my head and you've heard a bunch already tonight. Um, so that's my first comment. The second comment I want to um, talk about is I, I was shocked when my kids came home from field day the other day and told me they still can't touch anything. Um, they, they're still teaching them touchless kickball. They're not allowed to touch anything. This is not the beginning of a pandemic. We learned how many months ago that COVID does not spread through touch. Do you understand that these kids are together all weekend at the swim club, playing sports together, touching balls? There is such a thing as washing hands. Why are we still acting like this? It is such safety theater and it's so ridiculous. And it's making the kids not wanna play these sports or these, these gym classes or, or whatnot. Um, God, let these kids be kids already. I know there's only a week left of school, but really what is the purpose of this? And how does this make us trust that things are going to be different next year? The entire year, this district has operated on such fear. And I don't know how we trust that that changes for next year. I really don't, especially given that, you know, the governor lifted the state of emergency. There's school districts around the state lifting the mask mandate and Cherry Hill refuses to budge. So I, I would love to know how we're supposed to have faith in you for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Talia Hollander, please state your name and address. Hi, yes, Talia Hollander. Um, I live on 416 Hialeah Drive. Um, I'm calling in about um, our, I, my children attend Pulitz Day School, private school, um, and we got notified that we will be losing our busing next year because of a walking path that is in our neighbor. <clears throat> excuse me, that is in our neighborhood, um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm 
calling it on behalf of a lot of parents, we have a lot of concerns. Um, and through our research, um, this does not seem like equity. If this was a public school, this path would not be legally considered a walkway for a school. And therefore it would not be calculated in the distance between home and school. Um, the pathway is privately owned, not publicly owned, not publicly maintained by the district. Um, and therefore is dangerous to walk on in certain weathers. And because of this, not only did my children lose busing because the distance is sh shorter, our entire school lost busing because then it's not enough children for, a, um, for busing. Um, so we would like the township to please look into um, how this was evaluated. Um, we, I was on a different board meeting for the county and they said that it's a township issue um, that we need to take it up with the township to explain to them about, um, about this issue because um, the township has made this determination. So we would again like everyone to look into, um, like the township to look into this pathway that would not be considered a public school um, determination to lose busing, however, would be considered for our school. Um, so please um, look into it and if you could get back to the school or find a way to contact us with your findings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Jamie Goodwin. Please state your name and address. Jamie Goodwin, 112 Mansfield Boulevard South. I felt it necessary to share with you today um, so as to again bring importance to a conversation that is in fact revealed perhaps a pattern or culture in our district or at least board conversations. It was shared briefly about a plan to rename the Barclay Early Childhood Center after Estelle Malberg. As much as I have been honored to learn of Malberg's story and perhaps even more importantly, the importance and relevance of her legacy, this decision feels inappropriate at best and honestly violent at worst. This decision honestly and the controversy that preceded it both seem to be missing the point. A name is only a name if is only a name if never followed nor proceeded with its context. It is always easier to make decisions with no context of the issues that lie below them. The context that more often than not are what give those issues any meaning at all. So it is not enough to name a building after even the first black board member in our town, Arthur Lewis, and yet, and yet not tell us about a history of a town that never has had black names etched into its buildings, to not connect us to a present where students frequently are overlooked and are used to not seeing their names etched in honor rolls or in honor level classes, classes rosters to not tell us about a history and a present that still does not see black stories or black people. And in the same way, it is not enough to disregard the history and legacy of a woman that speaks to families, students, and there are often too few cheerleaders in our special education program, but simply to find her a new name to etch, a new building to etch her name into. I'm concerned that we are still missing the point are people really fighting for a name and a building? Or are they fighting for students whose names have been lost in IEP meetings and passive looks, disinterested administrators and unimaginative policies that still seem see the special needs of special needs, perhaps not an honors thing. We must be careful to not do the easy thing that feels like the brave thing, but instead continue to leave our students who have historically been in the margins, still in the margins. I ask that we do more than a building name, but bring light to students who are not used to being remembered. Tell us about their struggles of being students in the special education program. A black student in the special education program. Tell us about the practices and languages embedded with ableist notions. Um, there's so much more to tell us and the history and the presence. So let's not miss an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Rick Short. Rick Short, 1002 Chelton Parkway. Uh, first off, um, I'd like to comment on the uh, mass. Uh, basically, uh, at what point does the district say, uh, uh, we have no cases, we have no student cases. We've had one case all week, one positive case. So the question is, is people are frustrated. Why are we wearing masks? What's gonna happen in September when we have zero cases? Are we still gonna be forced to wear masks? At what point, it's, it's just ridiculous. 
Okay, let me move on to my next topic. I wanted to start talking about cultural proficiency and, and equity character. Uh, a little background on me is I've helped the uh, residents of Newark. I've helped the residents in Camden. I've also helped Sue Altman, who got thrown out of a Capitol meeting one time by the state police. Uh, I, I've helped uh, recently the nursing homes in Camden when COVID was happening. I've also helped the Camden schools. So I've helped a lot of people. But before I get into this topic, I wanna mention things that are just loony, loony in our town. Our town's gone loony on hate crimes. The average, the, the acts, the, 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 the chances of a hate crime occurring in Cherry Hill by you is 0000019. So why is there almost so much talk about hate when the odds are, are so minute that it would even happen? Why are we so obsessed with H, uh, uh, has, uh, harassment and, and imitation and bullying in school when it's really not that high? Now let's move on to the, um, how much time I got here? Okay, so your report on the um, document says that um, on page six of your report, on, on page six of 16, you guys totally miss a goal. I mean, how could you write a, how could you possibly do an entire thing and miss a goal? Goal one, and then it goes to goal three. That, that's ridiculous. Also, under the recruitment, hire, and re retaining of colored staff, you're forgetting about the LGBTQ community. You're forgetting about women. I mean, uh, do you, does the district reject racial pres precedent preferences of hiring administrators and staff? If so, how do we ensure we're not hiring all one race and exempting another race? This, this isn't diversity, what you guys are proposing. I'm running out of time. Um, let's move on to some other topics. This whole, there was, a, there was a study done that said 60 people were surveyed. Now we have to do um, uh, anti-racism training for 1,700 different employees. How many hours is this gonna be? How, many, uh, how much time, how many days is this gonna be? How often is this gonna happen? Well, I'm running out of time. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Next is Mel B. Please state your name and address. Melissa Bush, 420 Lavender Drive. Um, I'm calling in about the We Return to Learn. Though I appreciate the district is unveiling its plans for the 2021-2022 school year now, the process seems oddly familiar. Some of the verbiage may have changed, but it's quite similar to the plan that was presented in the summer of 2020. We were assured back then that our children were returning in September 2020, but then everything miraculously fell apart about a week before school was supposed to start. It's been a mess ever since. So are the teachers, educational assistants, and other employees on board with this plan? How do we know that you won't get a list of concerns and threats from staff in August 2021? Are you continuing to build up your substitute teacher pool? Though no virtual option is available for students, will any Cherry Hill staff members be permitted to work from home on full-time or a part-time basis? Will students ever be in person but be taught remotely? If a child is suspected COVID-19 positive, will that student be quarantined for two weeks missing two full weeks of school. I'm not shocked, but I am disappointed that these topics were not addressed and that no board members asked any of these questions. There are numerous, numerous other districts in the county, outside this one, throughout the state and across the nation that have figured this out. This plan has plenty of obvious gaping holes, but no one will speak up about it. Instead, we are bored with shameless self-promotion and accolades. Children, parents, and taxpayers deserve better than this. Please don't allow this district to become a bigger embarrassment. Thank you. Next is Michelle. Please state your name and address. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Michelle Feinberg, 1233 Santa Claire. So my question is regarding the wearing of masks by the children in schools. So it's in regards to the next eight days of school, but also for next year. So when the outside temperature is 80 degrees at 8 a.m., we're in a heat advisory, how can you tell me that even with air conditioning units in the different classrooms, that the school, that the rooms are not overly hot? By the midday, it's 90 degrees. Um, 
The governor says that school officials are empowered to relax masking among students and staff in their buildings given extreme weather conditions. So this leaves it up to each individual school district. So this leaves it up to Dr. Malos to decide what is best for these children. Wearing masks when we're in a heat advisory is not what's in the best interest of these children. Also, my son had field day today. So he was not required to wear a mask outside for field day, but yet he had PE outside where he was required to wear his mask. So how does it make sense that because they have field day, no mask is required, but when he has PE, they can't touch a ball and they have to wear their mask. So I don't understand the logic in the mask wearing when the rest of the world is opening up why are we not and all these other districts around us are making mask wearing optional for the next eight days? Why are we not looking at this and saying what is best for these children in a heat advisory? It just doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> next is Mindy. Please state your name and address. Hi, Mindy Rosen, Six Fairhaven Court. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I heard Jamie Goodwin speak and she inspired me to speak because she said exactly what I wanted to say about the renaming of Barclay. As you know, I was one of the people who fought to keep Malberg, Malberg. And so you may think that I see this as a victory to rename Barclay, Malberg, but I do not because I also feel it is missing the entire point to rip the name of a, of a special ed educator from one building and slap it on another, I don't think is honoring her in any way, shape or form personally. And there are so many other things that can be done to honor her memory. And the other thing you someone had mentioned uh, was that Barclay was named after the Barclay community. But the research that I had seen was that Helen Barclay, uh, who uh, has a giant long history in the area, um, she had given 32 acres of Cherry Hill. She had deeded it to Cherry Hill, including the Barclay Farmstead. I mean, there is a woman named Helen Barclay. And when, Scarb, when, when she sold a lot of the, um, of the land to Scarborough, Scarborough to rebuild, um, he named the, the development Barclay for Helen Barclay. So if it is named for the development, that name is for Helen Barclay. <laughs> So those are the, the, and the third thing I wanted to say in the beginning of the meeting, you talked about polling places. And I, I think I would be careful because a lot of our schools are not handicap accessible, um, strictly handicap accessible and polling places need to be handicap accessible. So I think we need to, the, the county or someone should uh, look into that be, or we need to, maybe finally bring our schools up to ADA compliance. Okay, thanks, bye. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Sugars, I do not see any other hands raised. Um, so are there any, um, any uh, written comments? I do have some, uh, Ms. Friedel. Uh, the first is from Tamara Steinberg. Please do, please do not renew the contract of Dr. Malash. As a parent who grew up in this district, I have never been more disappointed and sad at the direction that Dr. Malash is leading us. He's making the district top heavy with leadership that does not lead and making decisions in the dark without thought to the needs of the students and the parents. This district is far from the great district it once was and the blame falls squarely on the shoulders of the current superintendent. During the pandemic, he had a chance to rise and he fell. Now you, the BOE, have a chance to rise by putting in new leadership. The next is from uh, Jeff Potowitz. As I have mentioned before, please do a Google search for SFRA district profile and click on the search item that takes you to the Education Law Center. See the graphs, find the graphs for Cherry Hill School District and Chesterfield School District. 
In the year dated 2014, our required state aid was $44.3 million. Our actual state aid was $12.7 million. The difference was approximately $31.6 million. What could 80% of that $31.6 million have brought, bought us in Cherry Hill? The idyllic and energy efficient 900 plus pupil Chesterfield School District. New building costs about that much to build. Chesterfield is a smaller community than Cherry Hill. Chesterfield community members have said they lack rateables. So according to the graphs on the ELC website, their total property tax rate, municipal, county, and all their school costs in 2019 was 2.78. That was higher than the state average. For 2019, our graph on the ELC shows a property tax rate of 33.36. Economies of scale and rateables do not appear to make a difference for our community. SFRA was supposed to be fair and help decrease municipal overburden. This has not happened to our community. Under SFRA, state aid was supposed to be following the at-risk student into every district. According to the graphs on the Education Law Center website, this year, the Chesterfield School District had 753 students. The breakdown was 3% students were eligible for free and reduced lunch. 2% of students were categorized as ELL. They receive approximately $3,700 per student. <coughs> for Chesterfield, state aids following an at-risk students in their district. For Cherry Hill, even though it's 17 and 4%, our at-risk percentage is about six times and two times higher respectively. We only receive about $1,800 per student. This is about half of what Chesterfield receives per student. School board and administration, please put these graphs I mentioned on the ELC website about us on our school district website. Tell community members where to find them. Next is from Brandy White. I will be listening into the meeting tonight, including the plan for school next fall, as I am very anxious to hear plans and ensure that we do not have a repeat of the past school year. I was very unhappy with the way in-person education was handled, and my children suffered greatly with the forced remote instruction. I do not believe Dr. Malash handled our district well or had our students' best interest at heart. The constant flip-flopping, lack of transparency, and ultimately damage that has done to our students is incomprehensible, and I would just like to urge the BOA to consider not renewing his contract and looking outside the district for some new blood and the capability to handle a large district like ourselves. I would also like to put in a comment regarding the use of masks within our schools. I understand that the state has mandated that masks be worn within our schools. They has also given guidance now that it is up to the districts on how to manage those policies. Given everything the CDC has now said, even for unvaccinated adults, I would urge the Cherry Hill School District to oppose the forced wearing of masks, both inside and outside our schools for the fall, particularly for elementary students. It can absolutely be optional, but the science has proven that in time, it is time for these children to go back to normal life, and that includes the elimination of masks, just as their parents and older siblings are doing. Our special needs kids, our hard of hearing kids, and our speech kids especially need masks removed in order to succeed and develop socially, emotionally, and developmentally. Please make an effort for them like you have our immunocompromised children. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Matazzo, as Cherry Hill is considered a leader academically, they are, they are failing to follow common sense and are not looking out for students' best emotional, physical, or social health. Please loosen mass mandates as other districts have already. If a child or a parent chooses to wear a mask, fine, but it should not should no longer be mandatory. Enough is enough. Children are not political pawns, and Cherry Hills should be standing up for their students and begin to question and start asking the why. This should be highly considered, not just for the rest of the school year, but for next year as well. Kim, Kim Gallagher, please remove masks for the remainder of the year. The governor has allowed superintendents to make decisions for his or her district. Remove masks now. I understand that Dr. Malash's contract is coming up for review. I recommend that you not renew his contract due to his inability to lead. Dr. Malash has failed over and over this past year by putting the teachers union first instead of the students. Please find a new superintendent who will care for the students of this community. Alana Yaris, I am once again speaking tonight about to discuss the length of public comments since the district has gone to virtual meetings at the start of the pandemic. Board meetings drag on for endless amounts of time and the quality of work that can take place towards the end of a three or four hour meeting is severely limited. A huge part of this problem is the length of public comment portion, especially from emails received. I am happy that so many community members have become so actively engaged and involved. However, I think a disservice has been created in allowing the public to write in their public comment. 
in order to speak at public comment, the policy that was adopted before the pandemic should once again be adopted. You must be in attendance at the meeting in order to speak. Sometimes Ms. Sugars is required to read the same public comment over and over again from different individuals in the community. A pre-submission was not allowed before the pandemic, but when all needed to change and adjust only public comments submitted via email or mail that was allowed to be read. When we switch back to the community voice allowed to be heard, why did the board continue to allow public comments to be emailed in? Community members do not even need to be in attendance in order to comment now that their comments can be submitted beforehand. If an issue is bothering them, they can send it and have Ms. Sugars read it. There is no accountability of actually attending meetings in order to speak a public comment. Oftentimes a pre-sent public comment is read and the topic of the comment has already been discussed at length by the board and answered. I believe that pre-submitted public comments should be discontinued in favor of community members actually attending live virtual meetings and commenting at the appropriate time. Lorraine Contento, I have concerns regarding the book selection for our middle school population and the lack of transparency to parents of topics that they may consider inappropriate for the age of our children. Warriors Don't Cry, assignment for my 13-year-old son. There was a graphic attempted rape scene of a minor in chapter two. I won't quote it because it's too long and quite frankly, it makes me sick to my stomach when I read it. See folks, book assignment for my sixth grade son, chapter 11. Marciella, a pregnant 16 year old. I used to be really hot because of the baby. I'm as fat as a wrestler. I dropped out. I've been exactly to exactly zero parties. And I've been asked out exactly zero times, including the scum who got me pregnant. My parents were mad. They wanted me to graduate, but abortion or adoption, forget it. Then they get sort of excited about it. They both love babies, not me. They started praying for it every night while I was begging my body with miscarry. Is there a panel of parents that read the books or the type or are the titles picked by the teacher administration? Is there any way to give parents a heads up on any sensitive topics that they may want to discuss with their children prior to or even request a more age appropriate read for their child? And that is the end of public comment. Okay, so that takes us to the end of our second public comment. Uh, Dr. Malash, is there anything you want to say before we close? I, I do, Ms. Friedel, thank you. Um, so I'll work backwards uh, with my notes. Uh, so first, in terms of the books that we use uh, in each of the levels, books are reviewed by teachers, administrators, Board of Education members. Uh, there's paperwork that's completed on all texts to determine the appropriateness. Many of the texts that we use, uh, we work with Dr. Jessica Whitelaw at the University of Pennsylvania to develop critical literacy units to introduce the texts as there are sensitive topics that are discussed, uh, again, based on our curriculum, based on the expectations. All the books are outlined in a syllabus that's distributed to families and back to school night. Um, all books are outlined on the Rubicon Atlas, which is available on our district website. Uh, parents have specific questions about books. They can always start with classroom teacher. Uh, talk with the building principal. We have our curriculum supervisor who'd be happy to be involved, Dr. Mayhan, me. Um, we can always be available for, um, for discussion. Uh, just an overall one about wearing of masks. Um, there are guidelines that we are responsible to follow as a public school district in the state of New Jersey. Uh, the changes that we announced today and in the, in the information that we sent out in terms of dealing with extreme heat meet and follow the guidelines as they are presented by the Department of Education, the Department of Health, and by the governor. Um, I can't speak for what other school districts have done. Uh, my understanding is there are school districts, most of which would be outside of Camden County, uh, that have made blanket announcements about masks. Uh, we don't believe, based on the guidelines we have received from the Department of Ed, which we included in the information that went out to the community, that that's what the explanation that the governor talked about um, it, again, his statement was about extreme heat. We've actually quantified that, uh, made that identif identification of something over 79 degrees based on the additional research um, and what we did. So we are following along with those guidelines. As Dr. Mann and I talked about in our presentation, we believe that that's going to change probably during the course of the summer. I can't guarantee that. I can't tell you when that's going to change, but I do expect that, that will most likely change during the course of the summer, the way that other things have changed in the state. Uh, the governor has continued to talk about the requirement for masks in schools because so many of children, uh, of school age children, are yet, as of yet, unvaccinated, uh, and many of which are, are not yet eligible uh, for vaccinations, is what he's talking about. 
Um, so that's the overall mask piece. Uh, again, an overall about the, the uh, resolution that was on the work session about the renaming of the Barclay School. Uh, then Estelle Malbert name still remains on the administration building and on this building where the alternative high school program uh, is housed. Um, dates have not been set uh, for any sort of change in the names, but ultimately should the board uh, take that action on the 22nd to rename uh, Barclay Early Childhood Center after Ms. Malberg, um, we will set dates for when that will occur. The Early Childhood Center uh, being the spot with the to continue to carry her name will honor the legacy of the work that Ms. Malberg did in the school district. Uh, again, uh, as reflected in some of the resolution uh, with her time here in the district, she was an elementary school teacher, an elementary school principal. She was a school psychologist, one of the first ones uh, in a public school staff in South Jersey. Uh, she was an assistant to the superintendent and worked as a director of special services. Her work focused on um, not just elementary school children, uh, but children with special needs. The program at the Early Childhood Center um, is there established in order to see to serve um, children prior to their, their time entering an elementary school, and again, serves students with special needs. Mr. Lewis uh, was a Board of Education member, the first African American member of the Board of Education in Cherry Hill. This is the administration building, uh, which is why this building, this site was identified to honor his legacy and the work that he did uh, in Cherry Hill Public Schools. Uh, Mr. Short, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not sure where all of your comments were going or where the facts that you were reading off of. I'd be very interested to find out where you were reading that information from. Um, I have some questions about what you reported as facts. I have to say, when you speak at the microphone, you're speaking in a meeting, you may not use the term or refer to staff as colored staff. That's an inappropriate term and it's offensive. It's offensive to all of us. If you feel that you must talk about staff and ethnicity or color, please refer to them as, as staff of color. Do not use the expression colored staff or colored anything when you're speaking to the Board of Education or at any event here in the school district. I'd be happy to have additional discussion with you. Uh, Ms. Hollander, uh, you called uh, uh, in reference to Pullets, uh, if you follow up with direct contact, um, either via email or telephone call, uh, we'll be in touch with you for additional conversation. Uh, in terms of virtual learning for next year, as we stand today, the Department of Education, uh, based on the governor's statement, uh, the Department of Education has not provided any additional updated standards or expectation. We've been told that, there, that virtual learning is not, not an option. Uh, as educators and superintendents, at least in Camden County, but I know from other places in the state, uh, we're trying to work through the Department of Education so that it will still be allowed. We believe that it's one of the things coming out of the pandemic that's incredibly valuable is the opportunity for students who are sick or have an injury or for whatever reason are unable to attend school to be able to view what's going on in the class and to interact in real time with, with what's taking place in the classroom. As of right now, that's not, that's not permissible. You go back to the presentations Dr. Mahan and I have done going back into March. That was originally part of our plan going into September. The only notification we've received from the state thus far is that it's not going to be an option. We will continue to press. Uh, as I've talked with some parents over the course of the last week or so, whether it's about masks or other things, I always encourage parents to contact your state legislators. Contact the legislators, contact the governor. They are more apt to be responsive uh, to parents and to family members than they are going to be from professionals in the field, whether it's a superintendent, a principal, or a teacher. So again, don't ever hesitate to contact your, legislate, your legislators and the governor. Uh, our lockers are in working order. Yeah, we talked about if students are quarantining. Uh, Chromebooks will continue to be available for students. Uh, students will continue to maintain their Chromebooks during the course of the summer. We are uh, collecting Chromebooks and hotspots hot spots back from students who are graduating for students who are leaving the district. Other than that, they are able to keep them. Uh, there's a question about uh, a parent who is a sixth grader at Rosa and about redistricting. 
uh, as the discussion about redistricting goes through, there will be time um, and there will be consideration for students and what transition looks like. Uh, that will absolutely be part of the discussion. Uh, Mr. Stokes, you asked about kindergarten orientation. Uh, there will be information coming out from the individual elementary schools. It will also be available on our district website about kindergarten orientation. I believe an email went out with a survey to parents of children who are re currently registered for kindergarten to send in information about your child as they start to fill class lists. Uh, Mr. Stokes, again, you can contact me directly, Dr. Mayhan, the building principal where your child will attend, uh, any one of us, and we'll put you in contact with the appropriate people if there are. Uh, additional questions. Um, I will follow up with uh, Mr. Mishiosha regarding um, the experience with masks and air conditioning at Sharp. And I think that is it for me, Ms. Friedel, in response to the comments. Thank you, Dr. Malash. So we are not going into a second, if, a second second executive session this evening. So this will conclude the- Ms. Friedel, it just, I apologize for interrupting. It appears that two board members um, have their hands up. They would like to make a comment, Ms. Uh, Stratton and Ms. Arroyo. Thank you, <laughs> Ms. Stratton. Yes, thank you, Dr. Malosh, and thank you, Ms. Friedel. I, I had my hand up before you ended public comment because I know that board members do have the uh, ability to make a public comment when they would like to as a community member. Um, but I just uh, would be remiss if I did not also state that uh, although our responsibility here as the board is, I cannot speak for the entire board, only the board president can. Uh, and, and I certainly don't speak for the district. However, I will speak as a, as a black woman in America and let anyone know um, that the word colored is highly inappropriate. It is highly offensive. I was immediately taken aback and I'm speaking up on it because as a black woman in a leadership role, it is also my responsibility to educate those that may not be in the know. So um, I will uh, echo what Dr. Malosh said that, that that wording is outdated and inappropriate and we will not be used here in this setting. And I would hope that my other board members would uh, agree with me that that wording is not to be used here in any setting. And as would any other wording that was categorically derogatory, inflammatory, or highly insensitive of any type of group, whether it be for race or any other cultural uh, diversity or uh, di 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 dimension of diversity of any individual. So uh, I just needed to make sure that was said because as a, as, a, as a black woman at 42 years old, I know enough that when I hear things that are inappropriate and wrong, that I must speak up and say them because I have a duty to those that are looking to me as a leader to correct actions when they are incorrect. So thank you, Dr. Malosh for a- uh, uh, Thank you, Mrs. Stratton. Ms. Arroyo? Uh, thank you. Actually, I was going to say similar as a Latino woman, I refuse, refuse to be sitting in a room where that language is utilized. Um, so thank I do appreciate um, Dr. Malosh for you um, saying something and, and being um, upfront about our, the level of disrespect that term actually creates. And now I understand as a white Latina, I might not have personal um, attachment to what this could mean, but that completely is just like, it kind of shocked me in a sense. And I've been in a lot of spaces. So I just, you know, it's just one thing after another. And I think our board members, you know, and I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody, but as a, a, a Latina woman and, and Ms. Um, Corinne said some similar words, just thank you for acknowledging it. And because that addressing and acknowledgement is a very first step in owning and moving past where we are in this in the current state of the country. So thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Arroyo. I'm just making sure there's no other hands. Okay. Um, with that, uh, 
do I have a, is there a motion to, or I make a motion to adjourn this meeting? Is there a second? Mrs. Matlack, all those in favor? Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good evening. Good night everybody. Good night.